Antonio? 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 Antonio?
And I think this is one important aspect regarding the success of populists. Of course, not the only aspect. That would be too easy. But so this is an idea I've, I've written often about, and I will show you something. Whoops. Here, yeah. So I think that anger is an important aspect when it comes to the success of populists online. Because first, populists write provocative messages. They make people angry. They make their followers angry, for example, about minorities. And then they make other people angry about their rhetoric. So I guess everybody sometimes gets angry because of populists. And the thing is, I think we live in a digital system where algorithms might help the whole system. Because we, we know some things that are kind of disconcerting. For example, if you, if you use Facebook, and I guess nearly everybody does here, the algorithm decides <laughs> what you see and what you don't see. And I guess everybody knows this here, but um, one of the most important aspects, how the algorithm chooses if you see something or if you don't see something, is interaction. It's the number of likes, the number of comments, the number of reactions. And so I, I, have, I have this idea that right-wing populists are benefiting from Facebook's algorithm. And I call this effect um, Facebook or algorithms as a drama machine because they value drama, they value angry rhetoric when people click and then when they get a lot of likes, comments, shares, etc., they show this post to even more people. And the funny thing is, to sum it up, I've had this, um, I've written a lot about this, and just recently, like two, three weeks ago, a young data scientist in Germany, he, he tested this theory, and he really did some research, and he made an, um, an analysis of all the German political parties in the Bundestag. And he saw and he tried to find out which different reactions those parties get on Facebook. You see it here. As you all know, I guess, on Facebook you can also click angry, you can click wow, you can click love, you can click sad. And you see a dramatic difference what people click when it comes to right-wing populists. This is the AfD, the German populist. You see more than half of their reactions are angry reactions. And this is a significant difference to every other party. You see similar effects in countries like my own in Austria. We see that um, there is a huge difference, and you can measure this difference, which reactions populists, right-wing populists get. And this is, of course, important, because if they get a lot, a lot, a lot of angry reactions, the algorithm will favor that. We even know that the al algorithm, Facebook's algorithm, is valuing reactions higher mm -hmm. than the like button. So this is one of the things I'm looking in, and I think this is one of the examples what we can do as journalists. I think we need to ask the questions, which logic does the software have, and what values are part mm -hmm. of the software, and are we okay with that? Because I think we should not be okay with such a system. Thank you. Christina, may I hand over to you? Is this the microphone? I don't think, yeah, yeah. yeah. okay, no, sorry. Thanks. Um, yeah, uh, we at Spiegel <coughs> Online, we have, um, many different points of contact with algorithms, uh, both in our work as work, workflow tools, for example, and also as subject of investigations and on, uh, of our reporting. Um, in the data journalism department, we have developed um, some tools um, like um, yeah, a number of interactive applications and data-driven infographics that can be produced automatically um, with automated frameworks uh, in our newsroom so that we as data journalists do not have to be involved in every single project. Um, and the colleagues can use those applications uh, in their creative sound uh, articles. Um, and in the broader perspective of the newsroom as a whole, we have really many tools that, um, that support our work, like um, the recommendation tools for next reads, uh, for example, like transcription tools, um, monitoring tools for social media, um, ad marketing tools, and stuff like that. So we are really, in, in our workflows, we really have included many, many um, algorithms uh, already, and I think this is uh, the same uh, with every newsroom that you might be thinking of. And also, we have investigated um, 
uh, some uh, yeah, more relevant algorithms together with partners like ProPublica, uh, NGOs in Germany, other media partners or scientists in Germany, um, just to, uh, to focus on their, yeah, the, the debate on, on algorithms to foster the demand for transparency, for example, and um, to find out if there is discrimination bias um, uh, regarding the outcome of these algorithms like um, Facebook, Google, or the central, the most important system for private persons in Germany, the Schufa algorithm. We're doing a project right now with um, uh, the two NGOs, the OKFN and um, Algorithm Watch in Germany. Uh, and together with other media partners uh, and again many other partners so this is also a crucial thing about such investigations just to team up with as many partners as you can because uh, these projects are complex and you will need them. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So we have two aspects reporting on algorithms and working with algorithms. Matthew, you have been reporting on algorithms a lot. Can you tell us a little bit about the focus of your work? Yeah, I guess uh, it's important to note that I am not a programmer. I don't even really understand uh, how algorithms work, so that's not my focus. I'm trying to learn more about them so that I can figure out how they work. But to me, the most interesting thing is what Ingrid was talking about, how algorithms shape the way we see the world, how they shape the way the information that we get. Um, what I like to do, which I encourage you to do as well, is to ask what I call civilians, uh, people who don't work in the media, um, if they know that Facebook uh, fil <coughs> filters their newsfeed algorithmically. And over 50% of the people I ask do not know that. Mm -hmm. So in effect, they're getting a filtered view of the world driven by Facebook's algorithm, but they don't know that. They don't know that, they're, that Facebook is not showing them certain things. They don't know why Facebook is showing them other things. And they don't know that their, effectively, their emotions, their, the way they kind of perceive reality is being shaped by that algorithm. And I find that disturbing and fascinating. Um, and I think we need to think more about how that works. The, the, I remember Jonah Peretti, who built BuzzFeed, uh, said something fascinating to me, which was people share things online and they engage with them by clicking like or wow or whatever. They share things because they feel a strong emotion. It could be anger, it could be joy, it could be love, it could be fear. Um, they don't share things because they're true. They don't share things because they're factually accurate, unless they're journalists. Uh, most people share things because they feel true. Uh, and the algorithm rewards that. The algorithm picks things that trigger a strong emotion. And if you interact with them, that shows the algorithm that you want to see more of that. So if you click on things that make you angry, you're going to see more things that make you angry. If you click on things that are just funny, you're going to see more things that are funny. You're not going to see, you know, the classic example is riots in Ferguson versus people doing the ice bucket challenge. Everybody on Facebook saw the ice bucket and no riots in Ferguson because riots disturb people. Um, Facebook wants you to spend more time on the platform. Lots of ways they do that is they show you puppy photos and <laughs> baby photos and so on. And, and the key point for me is that Facebook, I think, likes to, and lots of technology platforms like to kind of wave at the algorithm as a magic box that you know is run by computers. And so computers determine what you see. But algorithms are written by human beings. And human beings have biases and human beings have even unconscious biases. You know, the way a 20-something white man in Silicon Valley thinks you should see the world is not the way maybe lots of other people think you should see the world. And so those, those are the people who are designing these algorithms that are shaping the way that billions of people see the world. And so I think that's uh, a huge issue. It's a concern for me. It's, a, it's something I think we need to deal with and talk about. And so that's why I'm interested in this panel. So, Jeff, uh, if the question is how algorithms shape the world, I think you did quite a lot of work on that. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Um, so um. I've been investigating algorithms since uh, 2010. Um, uh, it, we, it all started for me uh, during our uh, decennial uh, uh, census and redistricting. Um, 
And redistricting in the United States, we redraw our congressional lines to elect representatives. And I noticed how much <coughs> data political consultants had and how sophisticated they were at drawing the lines to get representatives elected. And we're seeing the, the outgrowth of that with you know the increased strength of our Republican Party in the United States mm -hmm. and the Very increased different. the overrepresentation that they have um, via a process called gerrymandering. I moved on to political targeting and email targeting in 2012, covering the Obama and Romney campaign and the ways in which they were using data to target um, <clears throat> to politically target their messages via email campaigns, and also one of the very first. Uh, uses of Facebook was during that campaign when Obama sent out a message saying, here are all your friends we don't think are going to vote, tell them to vote. Um, and that was micro-targeting on a scale that, you know, like uh, uh, on a Cambridge Analytica level scale. Then um, I sort of went and in, delved into the top secret world and reported on uh, the uh, NSA via the Snowden documents for a couple years. Um, but in 2016, um, my colleague and I, Julie Angwin, had sort of a realization that algorithms are not just Facebook, are not just Google, are not just Twitter, that they're increasingly used as scoring systems yeah. um, to score people's lives. And also there are historical algorithms that um, people haven't really recognized as being algorithms. So I'm going to point to two examples of that. Uh, one is a story we did about risk assessments. So. In uh, Broward County in Florida, they were using this risk ass assessment, um, which basically when you get arrested or picked up by the police, they score you, they ask you 137 questions um, as to, some of them are like, how often do you call your mother? Uh, another one is, if you're poor, is it okay to steal? And they output a score um, of how likely it is that you are going to uh, you know, get picked up again for another crime. What we found is um, this score had an incredible false positive rate for African Americans. So half the time, it predicted that African Americans were guilty, were going to be guilty of another crime when they actually weren't. And for white people, it was only 23% it was wrong. This is a clear bias in this score that can't be explained by the type of crime they committed, how many priors they had, um, how many, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, whether they were young or old or male or female, but had a clear racial uh, division. Some researchers recently found, and also it was terrible at predicting. Some researchers recently found uh, they asked people with no criminal justice experience to uh, score the people in our data set, and they found that algorithm was no better than just general human judgment. Uh, actually is accurate. Um, the other one that we did, uh, which was a follow-up to this, which is another thing about how algorithms always use, um, uh, how algorithms are uh, so pervasive in our lives. Um, we did an investigation into car insurance. Um, and car insurance, people don't normally think of as an algorithm, but it is a risk score. Uh, insurers use uh, a number of factors, you know, sometimes often hundreds of factors, um, to guess how how much they're going to have to pay out when they when they uh, sign a premium. We had no idea what all of those factors are, but we could measure based on the average. Uh, rate of collisions in a particular zip code, we could measure how different people were getting, um, getting price different insurance. And what we found is we found uh, in Chicago, we found uh, 31, 30 out of 31 companies were charging uh, African American neighborhoods twice as much when they had the same underlying risk, when they were equally as risky. Right, there's a clear sort of racial bias going on there. And we also replicated these results in four other states. We found it in California, which is the most regulated. We found um, insurers that were charging up to 25% more for the same car insurance. We found it in Texas, um, and we found it in um, Missouri. Um, and we found the same disparate effects here, right? This is an algorithm that is clearly breaking down that is not treating everyone fairly, 
But the argument that we got back from the car insurance industry is we use math. This is just <laughs> math, right? <laughs> Essentially, right? Um, uh, you know, regulators have never said any of our pricing was predatory or anything like that. We use tried and true algorithms. You can't argue with us. Um, last year, I used algorithms to track down political ads on Facebook um, by uh, crowdsourcing an investigation, built a browser extension so that people could scrape, uh, you know, uh, help us scrape Facebook for political ads. And we wrote a bunch of stories with a bunch of folks um, in Germany, and we're now uh, collecting ads from, I think, like a dozen countries around the world. Thank you. Do you want to have this question now? Yeah. Is it important to understand what Jeff was saying, or can we have it for the discussion later? Whoa, whoa. We need a mic. Oh, we need, we need yeah. a mic. For a streaming internet land. Yeah. <laughs> Just curiosity, since you spoke about Broward County, uh -huh. um, given the number of Latinos, I was wondering if the criminal profiling, um, what the results were for the Latino community? Well, I can't remember. I'll, I'll send you a link. If it was significant, given I, the, the area, of uh, the you know, it, I, I can't. I can't remember. Um, Latinos are hard, uh, are a little bit difficult in the United States because a lot of Latinos mm -hmm. identify as white when you right. ask them what their race is. So, like, that's always a difficulty in the United States. But I'll send you a link to the white paper. Okay. Thank you. So we see this uh, really are relevant results and it affects many, many aspects of our lives we don't uh, maybe think about at first sight. So my question is, and I first want to ask the Europeans on this panel, do we have sufficient reporting uh, on algorithms? <laughs> no. <laughs> Not yet, but I think it is changing right now. I think um, with, uh, for example, self-driving cars, with the Facebook scandal, with um, yeah, more and more topics with uh, the scoring system in China, for example. Mm -hmm. I think the public gets towards these topics uh, more and more right now, and um, we as journalists have to keep up with that. Um, we have to, to build strong networks uh, to, to get the skills on board or to team up <coughs> and join forces with, uh, with scientists, for example, and NGOs who can bring in those skills. But, um, yeah, in fact, I mean, yeah, given the actual... Um, uh, the, the capacities that newsrooms uh, are having right now and uh, the data teams that are working in newsrooms in Europe, um, we might not um, yeah, have the sufficient um, teams on board yet. Does everybody know what China is doing, by the way? <laughs> no. So China is composing a social score uh, for your engagement through social platforms <laughs> and that score effectively determines whether you get certain government services uh, so they're effectively taking your engagement score and turning it into something they can use to deny you uh, government services. So there was an episode of Black Mirror that was all about that. Yeah. And I feel like they watched it and they thought, that's a great <laughs> idea. We should do that. I mean, and this is affecting society right mm -hmm. now. It is, it is changing things. And I think we in Europe are now in the stage where we can um, control algorithms, um, or we, we, we can do something about that uh, and prevent such uh, systems to be implemented here. So, um, so. yeah, so um, I think, uh, yeah, regarding China, um, this, is, this has changed um, really things already. So, so about Europe, I think as uh, Matthew already said, no, <laughs> we, are, we don't have the same capacities at the moment like the United States. Um, Jeff and I, we talked yesterday and I think the issues, they're starting with education. They're starting with the training of journalists because the training of journalists in the United States, perhaps Jeff wants to talk a bit more about that, but it's already rather data driven. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, uh, especially in the German speaking countries, it's by far not that data driven. So it starts with the training and then it comes to the newsrooms because in the moment when newsrooms would say, hey, we would want to hire, I think the schools would change the curriculum, but we are not at the point where um, when you're a data scientist, a journalist and a data scientist, you will get hired. So I, th I see the tragedy where we all even have freelancers in that field and they are often freelancers or sometimes freelancers because they have more time to focus on the pro projects they find interesting. Because the thing is, um, 
not every newsroom has a data scientist or a journalist who is also coder. And sometimes we have the weird situation that those journalists, those, um, um, those mixtures of journalists and data scientists, they are working on very short term projects mm -hmm. in the newsrooms. And those are often not the interesting projects. So you need to have time for such investigations. And if the newsroom does not grant you enough time, you will not get that. And then there's one last aspect. I think perhaps it's different in Germany, but I can say it for Austria. We also have uh, problems getting the data. Because, for example, in Austria, we don't have a Freedom of Information mm -hmm. Act. And s s many, many things that ProPublica does, we could not do in Austria, mm -hmm. because you can s send a letter, but they will say no. And it's not the computer that says no, it's the <laughs> state official that says no. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I also think that it's changing in Europe, but I don't think that we are in a financial situation where it's easy to change. And then also there are la several layers, um, big problems, how to really get there. I think the FOI question is something we should yeah. discuss later. I, I have another question regarding uh, how to conv convince the newsroom to hire people in Europe. Uh, so I asked a rather naive question yes yesterday to Jeff if there is interest in the uh, audience reading these pieces on algorithms, because that might be one of the most convincing arguments to hire people who can do these stories. So can you tell a little bit about the impact yes. uh, and, and, and how the perception in the audience is? So when I look back, so uh, I think last, as of last Friday, uh, the machine bias article was still in the top 10 most read on our site. And that, that, that article published like two years ago. Um, so there is a huge, uh, there is a huge um, interest in stories right now about algorithms and the way they're shaping our lives. But what happens so often in algorithmic reporting is we lose sight of the impact on yeah. the ground. Yeah. So we we write, you know, and I'm very guilty of this because I'm not a very good writer, but and not a very good storyteller, <laughs> but. Uh, um, we write, you know, fantastic uh, narratives about how we got the data and how mm -hmm. we're hero journalists and, you know, we sued the government and blah, 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 and here's the, our findings, right? But to actually connect this to human impacts is what we did with the, both the risk scores and the car insurance, um, you know, finding people that are affected by these decisions. The thing that I will say um, in regard to resources it is very difficult to do a machine bias or a risk scores or, or a car insurance investigation. Both of those took six months and um, many therapy sessions um, <laughs> and, and lots of legal help and outside data science help. But the other thing that I will say is these algorithms are making decisions, right? And those decisions have real world impact mm -hmm. and it's almost a little bit easier understanding the nature of the algorithm. Like all algorithms, like all human judgment, make mistakes. It's not this black box that is just math. And so finding the mistakes, finding the impact of those mistakes is something that we're really good at as journalists, right? We've trained ourselves, you know, we have a profession that's trained itself to find those mistakes in, you know, a bar over drinks or in dinners with sources, but the cool part about reporting on algorithmic, uh, uh, about algorithms and um, algorithmic accountability is the outputs are usually visible, right? Um, you can see them in your, in your news feed. You can see them when bot accounts take over a hashtag. You can see the impact of somebody who is denied car insurance. You can see the impact of somebody who gets a high risk score, who is an upstanding citizen. And to s some degree, you can do a fancy scientific white paper that does fancy regressions and crazy math, or you can go and talk to the people who are outstanding mm -hmm. citizens who have, you know, been, uh, you know, uh, uh, scored as risky and don't have access to services that they need. And both ways are equally valid. If we get a thundering herd of the latter, mm -hmm. of the impacts of these algorithms, stuff's going to change. I think that's a really good point. I, I, you know, there are data nerds, I'm not naming any names, uh, <laughs> you know, who enjoy the process and, and, and are impressed by the data. And, uh, 
And then there are lots of people whose eyes glaze over when you start talking about algorithms. And I think even, actually I learned something from this panel I didn't know about al Um <laughs> That's a fascinating story. But a lot of people, the word algorithm means nothing. So they have no idea what you're talking about. And, and I think if you can deconstruct it and say, look, forget about the word, forget about data, forget about regressions or what, just this is the impact. This is what these things are doing. Companies like Facebook control them, the government controls them, and they're making decisions that affect your life. Decisions you aren't even aware are occurring behind the scenes, preventing you from getting insurance, getting you arrested for certain things. Um, those are the things that people care about. Yeah, and perhaps we also should not think about algorithmic reporting um, yeah, to, to, to be really detailed reporting on every decision-making step that the algorithm uh, really does. I mean, um, we have to focus on the basic principles, and I think we should compare those principles to the way we would, as humans, uh, make decisions. And if, if we got a bad gut feeling about something like uh, ethical questions or stuff like that, then we should think about how can we implement mm -hmm. this into an algorithm, really. Um, I mean, of course, we, we need those data nerds or data teams like, uh, like ours to, to disclose things and to, to write about um, the principles behind algorithms, but we also need the strong stories uh, beforehand. I would really, um, yeah, uh, really um, state that. And I think that's why partnerships are so important. Um, you can have teams that spend the six months and do the hard work and come up with the data and then maybe other people help tell the story or show why it's important. I also think I want to add that Jeff said that algorithms are visible, but I think algorithms are visible and invisible at the same time. Mm -hmm. For example, like for you and I guess for us who are really into this uh, topic, it's like, ah, interesting. Why is this site showing me this? And, or why is this computer showing me such a different um, Google search result than yesterday when I was at work, things like that. But um, I think um, it's, we need to get to the point where like the normal user has the same thoughts. Mm -hmm. And as you mentioned, the word algorithm Unfortunately, it's like the killer of attention. <laughs> it's like you say algorithms and it's over. And I was, for example, I was at the conference for teachers like last year, and I, I often talk about these effects of Facebook's algorithm and these problems. And I tell, and I always say, you know, when you have a Facebook profile, you don't see everything and software and blah, 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 blah. And I give my whole keynote, and at the end, the teacher comes to me and, say, and asks me, what, what do you mean by Facebook doesn't show me anything? Yeah. What, what does that mean? And I was like, okay, so we, even though I explained it, you see, you have to go even deeper. So I think, to be honest, I wished we would find a better word for algorithm, mm -hmm. a <laughs> word that is easily understood. Yeah. Like, of course, uh, how, you know, you, if you can always say it's how the software decides for you, but perhaps we can come up with a better word. <laughs> okay, we take suggestions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, when you're looking at real world implications. I've had great success with telling members of my family that if you search for airplane flights on a site uh, and you're in uh, incognito mode, you will get different results than if you search when you're logged in. Uh, you know, that has an impact on how much you pay for an airplane flight. And I've converted people to, oh, I need to go into incognito mode and then do a search. I didn't have to tell them the algorithm is assuming certain things about them, just that there was this real world impact to not doing it. We spent six months on airline flights. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that. <laughs> it's, a, it's very hard to prove. I'll yeah. just point that out. I spent 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> what also helped uh, in our case with the ProPublica project on the Facebook ads was just to, to, uh, to, yeah, to ask the users for some data, but also to give them something, something back um, immediately. Mm -hmm. um, and this were the, the ads they, do, they are not seeing at the moment. Like, okay, you, you donate or you spend some, uh, some of your data um, to us, but at the same time, you can gain insights that you would otherwise not get. And I think this ha really has an effect. If we can set up such experimental designs where we, um, yeah, where we have some some crowdsourcing uh, aspect, but also can show them what other people see. I think what is also important why this topic is so interested, interesting, even though in the general population is 
all the election we've had, yeah. and I'm not just talking about the United States. Yeah, um, you mentioned um, your ad targeting um, tool. I, I work together with um, Who Targets Me. It's like the alternative to your mm. software. And we have more than 1,000 users in Austria, sorry, who installed <laughs> the plugin. And, you know, we had an election last year. And most of the ads that political parties ran were really boring, like <laughs> really, really boring. So this was good and bad in the same way, like you could not always explain why it's so important. But then we had a scandal of anonymous Facebook sites, which were not saying who is behind it. Mm. And it was, um, for example, an advice of a political party of the Social Democrats. And they had an, a, like a fake site where they tried to have a smear campaign mm. against the other candidate. And when that whole thing blew up and became public, we were the ones having the data how they had targeted people. And it helped really show that they had put a lot of money into it, that they had specific, specifically targeted fans of this politician who was being smeared at, who was being um, made, you know, he was called a liar, he was being disgraced. So um, we then didn't talk much about the software behind it, but without the software, we would have known much less. I want to come back to one point. What you said, Matthew, was very encouraging. You said you don't even understand how they work. So that means that I could also start reporting. I'm not that smart. <laughs> no, am I, but <laughs> it's good to know. So everybody in this room, if, if he or she were interested, could start reporting on these topics. So I would be interested in which kind of training and which kind of teams do you need within the newsrooms and which skills. So if somebody here is a decision maker in a newsroom, what uh, would she or he, which kind of people or teams would she or he hire? Uh, I would I like to know a, a little bit about this, some tips. We need a lot more people like Jeff, that's <laughs> for sure. Fewer people like me. Um, I, think, I think, you know, there's fundamentally two levels of, of reporting on, on algorithms, right? There's the, uh, the anecdotal stuff that I just kicked out, right? Which is find people who are impacted by algorithmic decisions, right? And then there's the other part where we're going to go into a bunker for six months and collect and clean data that not everybody can do, right? Um, both of those, however, I want to point out, don't require you to understand what the algorithm actually is. In our car insurance example, the, um, we, I could form an actuary company. I sort of know how car insurance is priced. But it doesn't really matter in the end how, what algorithm they're using, right? Really, and um, in machine bias, the algorithm that they were using was just an off-the-shelf sort of thing. Mm -hmm. There are really only like a handful of these things that people can use to make these decisions, and it doesn't matter. You can't hold somebody accountable because they used a regression and they didn't use a decision tree, right? What actually matters in the end is where those algorithms break down. Now, this is a benefit for us as journalists because by their very definition, just by it's the same way with human judgment, by their very definition, algorithms are going to break down because what people don't understand, and this is what I want you all to take away, is that algorithms output a likelihood, right? So they output a chance that this is true. Um, and what humans do, we think in binary, right? We think that it's either this or that, right? So, they, so when people make these scoring, um, these scoring algorithms or tune the Facebook news feed, they pick a threshold. They say either it's going to be 50 per, more than 50% likely, that means this guy's coming back to jail. At 50%, that's a coin toss, right? And we're impacting people's lives at a coin toss. So finding the examples where that breaks down, in addition to doing the heavy lift data reporting and hiring people that can do the data reporting, or have the space to do it um, is important, and I think, and I think that you know, as somebody who's about to start running his own newsroom, which is crazy, and I'll talk to anybody about it if they want to hear. Um, I think we need to invest more in that sort of in that sort of expertise. 
in the collecting the data, especially now, right? The, the, the time where you were able to, for a lot of the stories, where you were able to sit down and get two or three anecdotes and write a story based on some source, that time only works for like Seymour Hirsch, right? <laughs> or or, or the, you know, Matt Apuzo. Yeah, and he's wrong a lot of the time. So I should have chosen Matt Apuzo. Um, the rest of us down on the ground are gonna need to start relying on data skills more and more and more. Because the cool part about data is, it's not just one anecdote, it's 10,000, right? And then you can do testing. Now, I know how to do all of this stuff, but I only know how to do all of this stuff because I've been doing it for 10 years, and I have a stable of people who are smarter than me backing me up. So I always take a first step at it, a first stab at it, and I send it to my, um, my statistics buddy, um, who we, I've been buddies with for a year, and say, how did I mess this up? How did I screw this up? And he's like, Jeff, not again. Come on, get your shit together. Um, and he tells me how to fix it. So I still have source relationships with people that are smarter than me, helping me analyze the outputs of these algorithms. So there are lots of skills, I think, that newsrooms need. Um, I'm going to say that all of those are really important, but the one thing that newsrooms need the most are managers, bosses who are willing to experiment, who are willing to do projects that take a long time, who are willing to put in sort of the effort, um, and who are just willing to sort of test out hypotheses. Um, is Fafa in this room? I saw him tweeting. Fafa, are you here? Okay, so Fafa uh, is a student, was a student uh, in Turin. Um, he and some, hey, there he is. So, so their project, the project you worked on, I thought was fascinating, trying to get people to, uh, to basically uh, track what Facebook was showing you and not showing you. So getting people to kind of volunteer to create a, a sort of dashboard, a way of, of looking inside the algorithm. What is it, what is it excluding? What is it including? A kind of, a way of sort of pulling back the curtain. Now that's, you know, not deep science, not uh, far more on the experimental end of things, but just an attempt to kind of get at what is the impact of that on what people are seeing? Because I think that's, you know, it's easy to lose sight of those things, but that's the real end game, is to talk to people about what they're missing, what they're seeing, how the, their sort of view of the world is being shaped. And Fafa, you can tell people about more of that later, if you want. <laughs> no, later. <laughs> but put your Where hand up. He? Put your hand up. Where? Yeah. Uh. So that's Fafa, he can okay. tell you all about it. <laughs> yeah, I also think that we, we need those data teams as uh, kind of interfaces or APIs uh, for such mm -hmm. topics um, for those people in the background that you have described. Um, like we need more experts um, to support us in these projects. Um, and we also need more yeah, like project managers in the newsroom because these are long-term projects. You need a really, really good planning for that. Uh, there are different steps. First, you, you, you have to gather data. You have to um, uh, call for participation, for example. Then you will find false positives. Then there have to be a good, uh, yeah, you, you have to have a good reporter then um, really um, with a good storytelling um, mm -hmm. to get more people involved. And um, so... I think um, these are new projects and we have to change our culture a little bit uh, to get them running. Um, to be honest, I think that the problem is that we have already an idea of what journalism is like and this is the biggest problem here. <laughs> I think that I, I often wonder what would journalism be like if we would not have journalism already and nobody would have an idea what a newsroom looks like because I think if you would start from scratch, the traditional journalist be the to absolute minority <laughs> And then you would have the data people, different types of I don't, data I don't people. Like that, I guess. Yeah, we we two are like we are the, like the outsiders there, and um, the people who don't know that much, but write it up. But um, then you would have you need the programmers, you need the the people for visualization. So you you, would, you have a different skill set, and I think that traditional media companies 
are perhaps too slow for that. Not for some projects, I think it's they do good stuff, but I think it's no wonder that this reporting is done by ProPublica, which is a new, rather new entity, or that you are starting a new, new startup on a journalistic level. In the German-speaking countries, Republik, I would say, is one of the most digitally advanced or like at least savvy, probably, um, newsrooms. I think it's much easier to do that when you start from scratch, because be, not doing that is the bigger problem. And just one thought. <laughs> I think the reporting needs to change then as well. You'll have the, the normal story, but behind the normal story, you have the in, you need to have the in-depth story yeah. for the scientific communities, for the geeks, for the people who really want to know it, and also be able to see if you messed up or if you didn't mess up. So this, and this is also very different to traditional journalistic thinking because you don't talk about such issues in older or more traditional newsrooms. But you should. Yes. Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. I was so <laughs> excited about starting from scratch, and we have somebody on the panel who will start from scratch, from scratch. But we will do a little cliffhanger here because I see that some people in the audience have questions. So we make a round of questions, and then we are very curious about hearing what is the new exciting thing. All right. Hello. Yeah. Uh, hello. Ha yeah. uh ha. -huh. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm Claudio Gosti. I'm one of the author of technology that I do, again, uh, an algorithm of Facebook analysis. I worked with FAFA about it. Uh, this is a technology that has something in common with uh, who targets me or has something in common with the ProPublica extension. So this is uh, exactly the, what we are calling about uh, the complexity we have to deal when we are re reporting on algorithm. There is a technical complexity, analysis, statistics, and then reporting. Uh, I call for some specialization. It's just an exhausting uh, um, way of doing, having uh, different groups uh, that uh, do their own technology, that uh, they have to do their own advocacy to have people adopt a browser extension and struggle all around uh, the same problem, which is uh, Facebook is changing the HTML structure and we have to do the same kind of fix in order to catch up with uh, the last update of Facebook. The goal at the end is enabling um, reporter, analyst, and researcher to understand how the algorithm is behaving. But uh, if specialization can uh, say something, we have to um, collaborate in the technology and uh, make an infrastructure that can be used by every researcher or every journalist also without uh, their technical knowledge. So that is somehow what I'm looking forward to, to have, because in this moment we are just uh, struggling and um, be less effective against uh, um, a model that is the one of Facebook or Google that uh, technologically will be always uh, uh, major than us. No? So uh, please collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I would support that. Yeah, our uh, extension is open source and um, everybody can help out if they want. But, but the point is not really the code, it's the amount of users. Sure. If the user are, uh, the the amount of visibility you can have over the, over the social graph. We need to uh, put together this infrastructure, yeah. otherwise we will have just uh, three different small groups. Agreed. That's a good point. Um, over there, please. Yeah. Can, no. can we have the micro here? Ah, okay. The lady with the... Hi, I have um, you on my... One very quick comment and then one question. The very quick comment is I, I couldn't agree more that we have sort of have to get over the embarrassment of talking about algorithms without knowing what algorithms <laughs> are. It's sort of like artificial intelligence or machine learning or a couple of years ago, the internet of things. Mm -hmm. We knew as intelligent people that we had to know what we were talking about, but we didn't really know what we were talking about. Um, so I think that's actually a big part of what the journalism writing aspect needs to do. Um, and then my question is one, um, maybe it's one for Jeff or, or any of you, but what's worrisome about algorithms is the bias, right? And sort of, and you know, when it comes to Facebook, we know that there's a kind of bias to optimize for the outcome that Facebook wants, right? Which is like a mm -hmm. commercial outcome. But what about the bias of those kind of off the shelf algorithms that you were talking about, Jeff? You know, is it, whose fault is that? Like who is, who, who is, you know, who's to be blamed for the bias of algorithms? Mm. It's hard, right? Because Trump. <laughs> no, it's hard because um, in every single one of the stories that I talked about outside of maybe the NSA, um, 
No, even the NSA. There's no twirling mustache. No. No one in no one in the car insurance industry is like, oh, we're just going to charge black people more, right? Um, the people who made the risk assessment algor algorithm fundamentally thought they were going to solve a problem of biased judges, right, and biased parolees, and they also were going to streamline, you know, streamline the uh, <clears throat> our our overbroad over-restrictive criminal justice system, right? Um, and make it so that people could do more with less. The problem is that they're, in that instance, what they checked is they checked to see if if, algorithm, if the algorithm was making the, um, was, uh, was correct most of the time across races. But as we know, there are two ways to be wrong. There's the way where you say someone's more dangerous and they're not. And you say there's the way where you say someone is. <laughs> Hello. Okay. Someone is uh, uh, not dangerous, and they go out on a murdering spree, right? Criminal justice agencies are interested in not letting those guys go, um, and they're fundamentally in the United States interested in uh, innocent until proven guilty. So innocent until proven guilty in the United States is fundamental to our our, our entire legal system. And this algorithm was inadvertently saying that African Americans yeah. were, it was uh, for half of the time when it guessed that they were dangerous, it, it was saying that they were guilty before they were Because it's hard innocent. to build something like that into an algorithm. Innocent right. Innocent until proven guilty is not something you can input into an algorithm. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it requires a lot of human judgment, and human judgment is fallible, but you can explain the reasoning. But I also think, there, I think one issue is efficiency. So I think what Jeff's talking about, if it's the insurance industry, if it's the NSA, if it's the government, they're trying to do things faster. They're trying to do things with fewer people. They're trying to cut costs. And so they outsource things to an algorithm. So they say, well, we'll just let the computer decide. And not everyone, obviously, but I think there's a certain amount of, if you want to call it laziness, or there's a push for more efficiency. Efficiency means getting rid of people. And the best way to get rid of people is to use an algorithm. And so then you just... Then, like I said, you can wave at the algorithm. You can be like, I didn't make that decision. The algorithm made that decision. And they're always right. Just one, or please, Jeff, I think. You yeah, just a, a follow on to that. What I find in my reporting again and again and again is that uh, um, it, de it depends on what the algorithm is optimizing for. Right, so the algorithm was in the risk scores was optimizing for equality across groups. It doesn't matter how the decision is made; just that it makes relatively the same right decision at the same amount of time. Um, uh, in uh, in um, the car insurance example, the car insurance example is a little bit more complicated. It's not that someone was sitting down and saying, let's rate these zip codes that are heavily African American more. Actually, what they were doing is they were optimizing for market forces. In the United States, African American and minority neighborhoods are cheaper, are, 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 are sorry, are poorer, so they buy cheaper insurance. When they buy cheaper insurance, you have to jack the price yeah. up yeah. to, to um, to equalize costs, right? So it's a market force thing that they're optimizing for, not the difference in risk, which is the idea behind insurance. And that's sort of like the original sin. Yeah. So understanding, when you're reporting on algorithms, understanding what they're optimizing for, in Facebook's example, they're optimizing for likes or clicks to the detriment of these other things is is a very good framework to start thinking about algorithms and how to do this algorithmic reporting. Also, I think that there are other real problems we have to look at, and it's not just bias. I think bias is the most creepy one. It's like the one where you, you really don't want to. Mm -hmm. But I think there's also the question if some algorithms are just crappy, <laughs> if they are like really not well programmed or they, they're, whole, they, they are, they're ha having mistakes in themselves. One example, in, in many countries uh, all over the world, um, if you get a, uh, a, a loan, there is the algorithmic scoring behind that. And you know, that the, so you could say there are two, 200 data points about a person and this decides if you will get the loan or if you don't get the loan, how good your score is. But what happens when they don't have 200 data points about you but only three? And one of these data points is where you live, the other data point is let me, your age and then perhaps, I don't know, some other thing. 
They have just three data points about you. So there is the danger that when the algorithm is programmed crappily or in a bad way, that for example, the where you live might be too highly evaluated. Mm -hmm. Then you live perhaps in a suburb out of Perugia where people are rather poor. Suddenly you don't get the credit, you don't get the loan because your score is too low. And this is, I think we don't just need to talk about um, bias. We also need to have some kind of new system where experts are rating algorithms if they're good enough for serious tasks. I have one follow-up here for Christina because we chatted uh, before that and you said that of course you at Spiegel Online are also developing and using algorithms. Yeah. And so you have some experience what you have to... Good ones though, right? Yeah, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> can you just very short give us an idea on what you have to take care of or what the process is like? Um, yeah, for example, when we are supporting the, the uh, our sports department with data journalistic tools and applications, we have uh, developed um, uh, like tactics boards. It's an interactive graphic that shows you or gives you an overview about one soccer match and um, the average position of every player and the, the networks of the passes they are playing or they have been played. So um, yeah, we, we produce this automatically, but of course uh, there might be some cases that we don't, that we did not uh, test uh, or, or train the system for. So we have to just yeah really um, yeah look at the system uh, and every outcome and just just be very careful with that. Um, I mean uh, another possible way would also be to do um, to do a little testing uh, with um, NGOs or partners just to hand them over your um, algorithms that you have been developing because I mean we want to um, want to have transparency. Um, ourselves, so we should should also be open about them, and we should publish them um, on GitHub, for example. And we did that um, just to to give everyone the chance to to check. Yeah. So it seems to be a good uh, opportunity to get to know what you have to look at if you mm -hmm. do it yourself. Okay. Yeah. I want to. There's a question. Yeah. Thank you. I, I'm sorry, but this is actually I'm a child at, at a graduate level course. This has been fascinating. But in 30 seconds or less, can each of the panel give me and any of the other children here websites that we can go to quickly? So targetme.com, which I think our Austrian colleague recommended, but simple, quick things that we can use. Please. What is really great is algorithmtips.org. It's uh, algorithmtips.org. Uh, by Nick Diakopoulos. It's it's a great, yeah, uh, great. website full of examples, uh, mainly in the US, but uh, you can learn so many things from them. And actually, Nick Diakopoulos, who runs it, is you should follow him yeah. uh, if you're interested in this at all. Nick Diakopoulos, this is all he does research related to this stuff. Yeah. There's an organization called stats.org, which provides statistical help to journalists pro bono. Um, they no longer answer my emails because I've <laughs> used the, the, every, I've gone through every volunteer there. Um, but uh, so don't mention my name. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, so um, it call, it's called Who Targets Me? Just to get, you get the correct site, and it's a plugin in many many countries, like in the German speaking countries, it's also a all active there. Um, and. To be honest, if you're more interested in the social implications and you want to understand the drama behind it and the, why it's important, I think you should read everything that Zeynep Tufekci has ever, yeah. I don't know how yeah. to pronounce her name, sorry. Zeynep but Tufekci. Zeynep Tufekci, and this is probably wrong how to pronounce it. Has everybody heard of her? She's the best, I think she's the best Zeynep. scholar. Tufekci. So Zeynep is Z-E-Y-N-E-P? And Tufetchi is T-U-F-E-K-C-I. Mm -hmm. She's a sociologist at, I can't remember the re university, but she's brilliant. There's, she's done a TED, yeah. at least one TED talk. Uh, she wrote a book about, she's been following social media for a long time and doing research around how it functions. We can Very tweet smart. it, we can tweet it later. Yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like, like Mark Zuckerberg, we'll follow up on that. Yeah. <laughs> because Zena, Zena follow on, on Zuckerberg. Militsa Pesic Media Diversity Institute. I want to go back to what Kristen and Ingrid said about the emotions. Everyone knows about Cambridge Analytica and the secret film Channel 4, British Channel 4, did about them. 
I'm sure you've seen it somewhere yeah. on, on internet, when they said, we deal with emotions, with fears, yeah. facts don't matter. I heard recently that in a UNESCO event that only in Europe there are right now 15,000 media literacy projects. Wow. So only in Europe. So all trying to educate the audience, the public, about what different media are doing. How do you, in media literacy, you are dealing with facts? Yeah. Uh, Cambridge Analytica and alikes are dealing with emotions. So how do you then deal with, actually, we are back to ancient Greek, classic yeah. Greek, uh, you know, Apollonian and Dionysian, you know, principles. Are we going to use emotions to help people understand what's happening? Where that's a, we are That's going? a really great Thank point. You. Because, again, journalists and media literacy programs and fact-checking and is all really valuable. And there are people who will be convinced because they want to learn. Um, there will be lots of people who will pay no attention. You know, we have, I like to compare fact checking to the, the list of ingredients on the, on the box of food or the, or the picture of a, of a cancerous lung on a pack of cigarettes. You know, that's a fact. Lots, millions of people smoke anyway because they don't care. They fundamentally don't care. And uh, if I'm having a discussion with my crazy uncle about Trump, my facts are irrelevant. Like what I am saying factually does not matter. And if I say that story that you said was wrong, it was made up, there's nothing factually true in it, I am not, we are not talking the same language. So we're not gonna meet, there's no way to convince him. So then how do you reach those people you have to understand where they are coming from. What is it that is bothering them? There is something that is pushing them towards stories that are untrue, and it is emotional. And in many cases, it's things that happened decades ago. In many cases, it's things that their parents believed. It's, these are things that are not, cannot be solved by an algorithm tweak, cannot be solved by a media literacy program, um, a friend of mine said that social media fundamentally is a, an accelerant. It's like fuel for, for fires, psychological, sociological, political, cultural things that have existed for decades or centuries. You, those, are very, right, those are very, very different, difficult problems to solve. And, and maybe um, journalistic storytelling comes into place at this point again because um, we, we've seen um, some, uh, some really great scientific work on the debunking of, of uh, false facts and the fact that uh, even, uh, I mean, only if you, if you uh, can tell a debunking story and you come with emotions again, uh, you can get rid of the emotional uh, false story that um, has been there in the first place. So um, we have to just get all our newsroom stuff together and tell emotional stories um, on or, or for, for, the, for the debunking of false, um, false facts and news. But I think actually, I think this is a really, a really good question because this is, so I, my whole work focuses on how, how you try to build up this space where people will, you know, will fight against misinformation and the facts are somewhat, somewhat getting stronger. And to be honest, I think this is the toughest part of all of it. Because um, I also saw this part in the Cambridge Analytica video and I found it extremely important. So what can you do? I think part of it is already happening in many countries. We are, we are reacting with emotions and I think newsrooms are doing that really strongly. Like what we are doing now is we are talking about democracy and we're talking about values, we're talking about the other side. We say, okay, but there's a danger to our society when we don't, do not have an informed public debate anymore. And so what all of this reporting is about is about building up emotion around the other side of it, about decide, do we really want to lose this well-informed debate? Are we, are we really into it? And I think that we are here, like it's uh, many people here, and many people listen to Mark Zuckerberg, even from, the, from Europe. I think it's changing because people are emotional, and it's again and again we have to keep on it. And if you're interested in how to, interested in how to do it, 
Der ist Elisabeth Wehling. Sie ist eine Scientist uh, at, Columbia, uh, no, at Berkeley. Sie ist eine Linguist. Und sie ist about its fra framing. It's, it's a, some, a completely different topic. But if you want to know how you can t trigger emotions and keep, make yourself better understood, read Elisabeth Wehling. She's a German linguist. She's really great. Thank you. We Wehling. W-E-H-L-I-N-G. We can tweet the two. And we have, a <laughs> we, we have one last question here, or remark. Hey, um, OK, so there's one question to Mr. Jeff Lart. Because um, a lot of the algorithmic storytelling is about bias. And so I'm from Switzerland. And for a lot of time, we have been thinking about what is new. What is neutrality? <laughs> so um, I would be happy to learn if there's anything like neutrality from you. And then secondly, I think um, I, I, I love all your ideas about data journalism and all this stuff, but I think that mic is really bad. Okay. Um, <laughs> so in 2016, we started a research in, in Switzerland on a company called Cambridge Analytica. And um, you know, we gathered a lot of data through um, freedom of information um, requests and stuff. Uh, my main concern was not to make it a data-driven piece, but to actually make it a story. And I think that worked out really fine. Um, I think the it's actually the main challenge is to hide the data and all that like all that like elite telling about which technical methods you used. I, I didn't, you know, we didn't mention it at all, because this is actually not bringing it to the people, I think. It's actually, you have to hide it, because what made Silicon Valley fail so badly was the overemphasis on technology rather than social science and understanding of, of humanism and how people work and function. And I don't want to see that being repeated in, in journalism again. I think this will be ultimately a failure Okay, thank you. It's a cool question. Um, so, uh, you know, the neutrality question, um, algorithms, algorithms aren't neutral, right? Like they're just, by their very definition, they're just not. They, they make decisions. Um, and, you know, uh, the one way to improve algorithms is to um, educate the users of the algorithm that they're outputting the likelihood. Um, and, you know, not all algorithms are going to have noticeable bias. I want to circle back to a very good point that um, you made, which is, uh, uh, you know, the accuracy of the algorithm matters. So the, in our machine bias um, article series uh, about the risk assessments, we also found that there was no bias when it tried to predict violent recidivism, but it was only right one in five times, right? That is also a story. So like you have a 20% chance of it being right, but four-fifths of the people are being uh, labeled guilty without in, uh, innocence. Um, on the second question, I think you're, you're um, sort of being a little bit wishy-washy in your logic in terms of the fact that we're going to all become Twitter and Facebook and robot machine journalists. I, I think a large portion of what I've been saying up here is that storytelling does matter. Um, but we're, we have the benefit of being on the internet and showing your methodology and showing your work is a good portion of the credibility, right? So if we're on the internet, we can run the main bar right. that glosses over our findings we can run that white paper that shows exactly summarize. how we that did it. It doesn't, summarize. he summarizes, summarizes. We can show the white paper that shows exactly what we did. And that is a fundamental uh, uh, sort of, um, uh, that is a fundamental tool that we have to be transparent right. and to not be like the show Silicon Valley work. companies. Um, the other thing that I will say is I think you probably did make the right decision with the Cambridge Analytical stories that you did. Not every sure. story is a data story. Every story is informed by data. Um, there's not a, hasn't been a story that I've come across in my career that couldn't have used a little bit of data um, or facts to back it up. Um, but 
you know, the stories that I outlined here, like any good investigative journalist, I have a bag of bad ideas that I carry around that I'm gonna circle back when I have time to, right? So not every story, like, you know, we talked about flights. We spent six months investigating sites like, you know, Kayak for this particular bias. And there are too many inputs, there's too much outputs, there's too much noise in the data to be able to do that story, so. Also, neutrality doesn't exist, so. Thanks a lot. I want a very, very quick glimpse in the future. What's next? And I start with Ingrid, and I finish with Jeff. So I've been writing no, down. No, no, I start with oh, Ingrid. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> you get the last word. So what I'm hopeful is that we'll see organizations like perhaps ProPublica, similar to your project, in Europe. And what I'm also hopeful is that. Um, the word algorithm will not be a killer of attention. For example, I give you one anecdote, and I'm not sure if I'm allowed to tell it, but my book, it has a subtitle, and it's, um, it says uh, why how fake news, um, populists, and uncontrolled t technology is manipulating us. And I wanted to put the word technology in the uh, algorithm in there, and my publishing house says, no, don't, don't put the word algorithm anywhere on our cover. <laughs> and I'm like, yes, but how, how to call it, what to call it then? And then we came up with this weird other word. And I think in, the, in, in five years, when you write a book for like normal people, it will be okay to have the word algorithm on it, and this is good. And we are in this field in between. And then the other thing is, I think there's also something good happening. Um, we have a debate in which it's not anymore, we are not being treated anymore as if we were all stupid. And last year, like last year I was in Perugia, we were, I think, being treated as if we were completely stupid. Because when the whole um, craziness about the US election broke out, there was Facebook's first answer, we are a neutral platform mm -hmm. and we don't want to be the arbiter of truth which totally ignored that they are the arbiter of what people see and what people get to know as true or what they learn. And I think this is an argument Facebook is not making anymore because they noticed people will shout out. People will say this is an insult to our intelligence, what you're saying here. And I think so we have come a long way in just one year. And I think because of reporting by the Spiegel or by UCHEF, I think, I hope that it's be, be even more in like a year or in two years, and then we'll see perhaps next year in Perugia already. <laughs> Actually, the Reuters Institute has a great uh, term, computational propaganda, which is one of my favorite uh, new terms. So the type of thing that Facebook does, that YouTube does, the YouTube recommendation, um, essentially pushing propaganda, but using algorithms to do it. I have a sort of, uh, dark view of the future where what China is doing becomes more common. Um, there are very, very powerful forces, economic and political forces that are pushing algorithmic control of things, either because they want to simplify or they want to cut costs or it allows them to do away with people and use algorithms instead. And I think those are going to be making more and more decisions about our lives, not just you know what memes we see in our Facebook feed, but whether we're targeted for certain things, whether the NSA sends a drone to our house, whether we're, you know, whether missiles work their way to our neighborhood somehow, depending on where you live, it's going to become, it's going to happen faster uh, or slower, but I think it is happening, so. so. Sorry, may I add one sentence? I think we'll have algorithmic regulation in Europe. I think this is changing. Yeah, I hope so too, and I would like to add <coughs> Um, ah, I would like to add that um, one thing I think we uh, or th this whole debate will will influence our own work and will influence how we deal with uh, transparency about our relevance criteria, our methodology, um, and and everything that we do. So hopefully, um, users will be able to to really get a bigger or a, a more detailed picture on what happens in newsrooms. Um, uh, soon, and we will have more and more collaborations, even amongst um, competitors, like we had it in Germany with uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung and uh, NDR.
broadcaster, which is, I mean, um, usually we are in different uh, investigative networks, so this is really something uh, politically, and um, we made it, and this has been great fun, so um, hopefully the, the data journalism scene and how we work together with, with a very open culture will influence uh, journalism, uh, journalism much more. I think um, in terms of platforms, I think the platforms are going to lock down API access, which will mean that we're all going to have to um, double down on that in order to see what's actually going on in there. Um, it's going to be increasingly harder to get data out of them. So we're going to have to, you know, beef up uh, uh, programming teams to build extensions. I think that we will see an, a, a dramatic increase in things like risk assessments mm -hmm. and um, increased. Is, is GDPR actually making it harder to get data? Well, I don't know the answer. <laughs> I, I, you know, maybe, I don't know. Um, but I also think that, um, you know, I think we'll just see an increase in, in what I like to call small algorithms, algorithms that are used in daily life, um, alternate risk scores that are going to be completely transparent. For me, I think, you know, I'm starting a new organization that is going to focus on investigating algorithms, and I'm going to repeat back the good ideas that were here. So project, we're going to have a project manager in the newsroom. <laughs> we're going to have reporters working directly with programmers. Um, uh, and uh, we're, you know, and we're just going to, we're going to focus on, you know, platforms, um, privacy, uh, you know, social justice stories, small algorithms, and, um, doing a complete sort of census of the internet in terms of uh, privacy viol violations and, and malware and stuff like that. So. Great. We will be following your project with great yeah. interest. I thank you all a lot for your great questions. I thank, thank you for the panel for your very interesting contributions. I learned a lot. I see that we have plenty of work ahead. So um, let's work. and. <laughs> We will tweet the links and uh, we hopefully will find a new name for the good old El Quarismi. Thanks a lot. Have a nice Thank afternoon.
Okay, perfect. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our panel on uh, how German uh, media groups are reorganizing and uh, centralizing their news distribution. I'm pretty happy that you all came here. We know there's a huge uh, uh, session right now on Facebook, and we're really happy that you uh, decided to come to join our session here. Um, my name is uh, Steffi Dobmeier. I am the managing editor of Funke Media Group Online, based in Berlin, and part of the editorial chief team there, and um, I'm here on the panel with some highly regarded colleagues who in real life are kind of competitors, but for the duration of the session, I guess we just leave that apart. So um, they're going to introduce themselves for a second. Okay, my name is Michael. I'm uh, working for a um, newspaper group in northern Germany called NOZ, NOZ Medien or NOZ Media. <laughs> Um, it's um, the, the founders of that newspaper group sit in Osnabrück. It's a small town between Hamburg and Cologne, but it's not, that's not very interesting for you. Um, two years ago, our newspaper group bought another um, newspaper group in northern Germany called MHN Media. And since then, we are, um, you know, we are thinking about how we can work together in the digital but not digital world. And I'm sitting here because I'm in charge of one of the new project that came out of this uh, merger. Uh, we founded a, a centralized digital newsroom in Hamburg where we produce national and, and international news for our whole group. Yeah. My name is Wolfgang Büchner. I'm editor-in-chief of um, the Redaktionsnetzwerk Deutschland, as it is called. This is the central newsroom for the Matzak Media Group located in Hanover, northern Germany and um, that delivers uh, news uh, for our 12 own regional newspapers and 30 additional partners. Mm -hmm. um, I'm uh, Daniel, I'm a media correspondent uh, freelancing for um, public uh, broadcasting ARD, television, radio in Germany and for newspaper Tats. So I'm uh, actually covering uh, what uh, these colleagues are doing. And um, since I don't know how many of you are familiar with centralized newsrooms, uh, I have no idea of how it works in, in other countries in Germany. I'm just going to give you a short introduction of what centralized newsrooms are and why they are created. So in the last uh, few years, more and more media organizations in Germany have created uh, central newsrooms, both for print and or digital. Um, that means that all the national and international news are um, produced in a central unit and distributed to different papers and websites of uh, the media group. Um, there are different uh, media groups who are doing this. Some of them are sitting on the stage, but there are even uh, some more examples. And there are a lot of similarities when it comes to all of our structures and distribution, but there are a lot of uh, differences as well. So for a start, I'd say that each of us just explains a bit uh, how those um, centralized newsrooms work. Yeah, I'm going to come start. Okay, um, Funke Media Group has uh, created a centralized newsroom about three years ago, almost, in August uh, 2015. And we are based in Berlin. Uh, the media group owns 12 regional newspapers that are located more or less all over Germany, except for the southern part. Um, they have different sizes, so um, just different regional local newspapers. And altogether, they have a circulation of about 1.5, uh, 1.4 million daily. And um, we have 15 websites uh, that we are working with, um, with a monthly reach of about 75 million. So before the centralized unit, all those newspapers had complete newsrooms for regional and digital, uh, regional and national. With the centralization, we have just combined all the national offices that, or the national teams to one huge unit. So we're now um, producing 
all the national and international content in our centralized newsroom in Berlin. We uh, work with like 70, peop uh, 70 people altogether for print and digital. So we're doing all the news when it comes to politics, business, entertainment, service, um, media, all those uh, things are created uh, in the central newsroom in Berlin, both for print and digital and distributed to all the papers and uh, the website. So that's the basic, I guess. Yeah, as, as Steffi said, there are a lot of similarities um, um, in our structures. Um, at Matzah Media Group, we started in 2013 um, uh, with, uh, with the construction of that uh, newsroom in Hanover. Um, sorry? No. Okay. And um, we, um, we deliver um, ready-made pages uh, for all our partner papers. As I said, there's 12 um, regional papers in East and Northern Germany in our case, but then we have 30 additional um, um, customers, uh, clients from outside. Um, and of course, uh, communication with all those clients, internal and external, is key in, uh, for, for us that this works. Um, I think a little difference between our two approaches is um, that we uh, produce only one, let's say, uh, one form of a page. I mean, we, we produce for several newspaper formats, uh, but we don't exchange like pictures or texts on the pages. There's only one, um, let's say, one page for, sorry? It's kind of hard to concentrate uh, when somebody's on the phone. <laughs> oh, oh, you're translating, sorry. Okay, and, um, um, and then we, of course, also um, deliver news to the uh, regional websites. Uh, and also there's, I think, a little difference. Uh, we now produce directly on the regional uh, pages uh, from Hanover. So the regional um, uh, newsrooms, they, um, they steer their, their regional websites with regional and local content. And for designated um, um, areas in those pages, uh, we push uh, the national and international news directly from Hanover. The difference is that we're only publishing on the um, like all the politics content is published directly on the politics subsection of the page, but uh, which of our news is put on the front page, this is the decision of the newsrooms, the different newsrooms in the local areas. So we're just producing the content, but the decision on how the website looks like when it comes to, um, to digital is in the hands of people outside our centralized newsroom. And yeah. you're doing it directly. Yes, yeah. we're doing it directly. And the next step will be that in the course of this year, we're going to produce all the regional websites from Hanover. So because we are in the process of, uh, of a web to print um, uh, workflow, of, 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 of installing a web to print workflow in all our editorial teams. That means uh, around about 600 uh, editorial staff in all those regional newspapers. And uh, what, we want to, um, what we want to achieve is that everybody produces for our digital products first and only um, in the course of the day, maybe in the afternoon, starts to think about the paper. And I think you're doing it totally different, right? <laughs> More or less. Well, not totally different, but I can begin with some differences. Uh, uh, um, what, uh, so what is different is that we are a little bit smaller <laughs> than the Matlack and uh, Funke Mediengruppe. Uh, smaller in terms of reach, um, and uh, what is different is that we are right in the beginning of that process yeah. that has already um, been uh, rolled out in uh, Hanover and Berlin. So I'm talking here about some kind of a journalistic startup. Yeah. <laughs> I found it in Hamburg two weeks ago with uh, six people, and in May we're going to be 12 people, uh, and we're still hiring for that um, central editorial team we, are, we found, it, found it in Hamburg. Oh, multitasking, um, and what is, well, some things are very similar to Funke and to Matzak. Our main goal in Hamburg will be to produce um, quality journalism in national and international news and to produce them f for all of our websites and to publish them on the section pages 
but um, the front page of our local newspaper websites still is in the hand of the local editorial team because we, this our, our idea was it's better to, um, to be the manager of a home page or a front page if you can see through the window if it's stormy or sunny or something like that and you can mix the, uh, the stories you have through your local lens. And this is, was the, uh, the reason for us to, to, um, to build up a new office in Hamburg, but to let people um, the, uh, the control of their home pages uh, in the local editorial um, teams and locations. When it comes to print, you're doing when it comes to print, you, you do differently, right? Yes, uh, when it comes to print, I'm not sh in charge of this because this is why I'm talking about online today, but uh, uh, the NOZ uh, used to produce um, pages for partners uh, since almost 20 years now. And uh, um, uh, in, in, the, uh, in the new group of the two uh, former media groups, we are still discussing what are the best ways to produce print content together, and we we um, have an ex exchange of pages, but not not um, and uh, on uh, and text and uh, images, but it's not s so well structured. Or uh, oh, you're welcome to buy it from us. <laughs> 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 well, m m maybe from a broader perspective, uh, as me not involved uh, in these operations, I think what we are seeing there is uh, is a good uh, stage uh, for for uh, regional journalism because uh, actually there is huge investment uh, in uh, in the digital uh, products and teams and also in the national uh, coverage. Uh, let's say what happens uh, in Berlin, uh, especially um, in the Bundestag and uh, well. Angela Merkel and co. Um, and uh, I think that's that's good for the future of all these uh, units because uh, it's making them stronger, uh, let's say journalistically, but also on the uh, digital um, uh, um, digital um, uh, point of view. Um, but to the truth, uh, I, I'd like to add that um, that also, of course, is an efficiency program. Um, these are um, some more, some less. Um, cost-cutting programs we have seen in the Funke group um, two stages uh, of um, that centralization of news in the first stage uh, we've seen they've uh, they've uh, cut a lot of jobs um, guys uh, that 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 made the uh, the the national um, uh, pages in the in the newspapers um, now the second stage um, uh, that that's an investment of course uh, I would say a huge investment um, and that's uh, that's a good thing. And I think on the long uh, on the long run, uh, we will also see um, uh, cutting of costs and jobs, because uh, as you as you mentioned by uh, um, telling him uh, uh, that uh, you can produce for him, um, you are all competitors now. You are not only working for your groups. Uh, you are trying to get other newspapers outside of your groups to join your model. Uh, and in these newspapers, and we will see, um, let's say, a, a big wave uh, of newspapers coming uh, to your models, because uh, uh, it makes uh, really makes sense to do that. Um, uh, they uh, will um, have the chance uh, to cut the jobs um, for for the people and the journalists who've done it, that before. But it, it depends, I must say. It is. Um, you're right. There is an economic logic behind all that, uh, but it's also and it always has been, uh, I can only talk about Matzak, I think it's true for Funke as well, um, there's also always the thought, how can we uh, keep high editorial standards? How can we, how can we produce um, quality journalism on a level that is um, uh, where we can compete with the big national newspapers like Süddeutsche Zeitung, um, FAZ, uh, or the big magazines? And this is what's, uh, what's actually happening. I mean, if you look at the ranking, who, is, who, who gets quoted most uh, now uh, on, the, on, the top, uh, on the top spots of that ranking, uh, you now find uh, Funke regularly, um, and uh, we are improving, um, but also uh, made nice progress last year. Um, and that means um, 
we, we get much more exclusive content, we get much more interviews because politicians and uh, economic leaders and, 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 and other important people know they are talking to a newsroom or to, to a media group that delivers the news to, um, in our case, also one uh, uh, two papers with a combined circulation of 1.5 million. Um, and that is more today than the Bild Zeitung has. Uh, that was once the market leader by far. Uh, and uh, same is true for Funke, I think. Um, so the f things have, have changed a lot there. Uh, where we have a lot of homework to do is in the um, in the field of digital publishing, and, and this is maybe we want to talk a little bit more. Um, what I want to add is that a lot of these smaller newspapers that are now part of uh, the media groups and part of the centralized newsrooms, they used to have their own national team, of course, but it was quite small. So maybe just like two or three people, even less. Mm -hmm covering all the national things. So even if you had a newspaper from Hamburg with a Berlin office for all the national politics stuff, it was a quite small Berlin office. And we have now combined all those Berlin offices. This is, that might be a way to, to look at this. And you have now dozens of people covering all the national stuff. So you have teams who have responsibilities in, in the business field or in the politics field. We have a huge entertainment team. So you have much more expertise, much more competences, and, and, and that also is an advantage for the smaller papers that are now part of this. So they get something out of the newsrooms, of course. It's true, and then I may add, it's not only true for research and writing, um, it's also true for the production of the paper. Uh, like, if you look at a lot of small regional newspapers, the truth is there are two sad people sitting there using wire agency material and um, making copy and paste, put it on the papers, uh, and then claim, hey, we have a complete newsroom where we do everything from local to national. The truth is they do copy and paste from wire service material, uh, which ha doesn't have to be bad. I was in charge of a wire service, so I don't. I don't speak badly about wire services, but of course, as uh, uh, you're, you're, um, you always try to have exclusive material um, and, and to cover, uh, to cover uh, uh, all the important stories yourself. And, and that we are able to do with those central newsrooms. And at the same time, I think if you take so away all the national and international things, then the newsrooms and the local parts and regional newspapers, then re they really can concentrate on their local and regional stuff. This is also a plus point, I'd say, from my point of view, when it comes to those centralized units, that you, you take away like the responsibility for national and international use and leave them with the things they know best, which is like the regional and the local news that are produced in the areas where the newsrooms still are located. That might be the same for yeah, you, Rain. Absolutely. And if, if you look in the history of uh, the digital transformation of regional newspapers, so I don't know if it's the same in other European or uh, worldwide countries, but in Germany, 10 years or 15 years ago, we, we had very small digital teams, sometimes only one or two people, um, and they focused mm, naturally or normally on, on local, uh, local uh, topics, and then Years, years, year to year, the, the the success was growing. Hopefully, and we could add new people uh, to our digital uh, digital editorial teams. But I think we uh, we learned that if you want to be uh, really good at national and international digital journalism, you have to concentrate in that. And so we we like uh, Steffi said we. Um, we discussed about focus, so and the focus of local, the local digital team in uh, in Osnabrück or in Flensburg is what kind of local journalism do we want to produce in the digital age? What what are the storytelling ideas and formats, data journalism, etc. We can produce in our local and regional storytelling, and the centralized department in Hamburg focuses on the same. Um, journalistic formats, but on other topics, and so we want to grow together. And um, I, I'm, I'm convinced, even uh, if I said that we are some kind of uh, startup that 
uh, tries to, uh, to, uh, to walk, <laughs> uh, convinced that we can do that and that we can achieve a new level of uh, quality journalism in, uh, in, uh, in national and international news. And um, for me, it's, uh, the, it's now the, the time to, to make yourself um, ehrlich, uh, yeah, and you kind of halben Sachen mehr machen. We say in Germany, it's you don't seek the cheap way out. You have to, 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 to push it forward now, because most of the national competitors in the digital world also try to come in your local and regional area. So we, I don't know how familiar you are with uh, the German um, media landscape, but Spiegel. Uh, online not, but others like Focus Online, uh, Focus DE, they try to um, to cover regional and local topics, uh, and so this is kind of a um, competition or war <laughs> uh, about the, uh, the the audience in your local market. Uh, I, I think what's uh, very interesting to see is the moment that um, regional newspapers, uh, your teams, are. Um, getting, uh, um, let's say, interesting as an employee again. Uh, we had uh, years um, in which uh, working for regional newspapers, for journalists um, that are focused on uh, national topics or, um, or digital products um, weren't that uh, interesting. And now, because there is a huge investment and it's a very um, fast-changing uh, business, um, Friends of mine who are uh, young journalists are thinking uh, about applying to to your uh, to your teams, um, like they are thinking about to apply at Spiegel Online or what uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung is is doing. And I think uh, that is um, that is an example uh, how um, how good this change um, of centralized news business uh, in uh, for regional newspapers. Um, uh, is for, for journalism uh, in, in, in the broader view. Can you anything you can talk about that a bit? Because you are like recruiting right now, you both, right? Yes, we are. I mean, we have kind of finished with the first group of uh, the cr first round of recruiting, but we still get like uh, applications uh, from newspapers and from media that I wouldn't have thought possible. So, um, yes, um, we. One of the reasons we uh, we um, moved our new digital operations to Hamburg was the the idea or the the wish that we attract new um, new kinds of journalists or talents or new new audiences uh, in hiring journalists because of course it's sometimes it's difficult to get people from uh, from a from a bigger city to a small city like uh, like Osnabrück but. Um, um, uh, this, is, this has two sides. We still have to focus on hiring the best digital talents we can get in our local teams because otherwise you, um, you are in danger of bleeding out your, your, uh, your editorial teams in your, in your, uh, in your local um, 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 area. But so what we, what, we, what we learned is that it's, and I can, uh, Daniel has made, it, made the right point. It it's, um, seems to be attractive to apply for a job at a regional media house that, um, that goes a step into the digital future in, um, uh, in um, founding, uh, founding a centralized newsroom. I don't know if you um, no, see really the same. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, the, what has really changed is after years where regional um, Publishers only could talk about shrinking business. Now we can uh, talk about a growth story. Um, like when we started, we, uh, we started in, at, in Hanover with only two papers working together. And then we integrated more of our uh, internal papers and then we got our first external customers. And now uh, that really, it, it, that does something to your newsroom and to, to the motivation of, of the colleagues in your newsroom when um, every few months uh, you are standing in the middle of the newsroom and say, folks, we got a new customer, uh, we, are, we are growing, um, things are going well. And um, so now what we are doing is um, on that basis, on that new platform uh, that we um, have built, um, we are investing heavily in two things. One is um, education. 
education of our editorial staff, not only in the centralized, centralized newsrooms, but also in all the regions. Um, since the beginning of that year, I think we had about 800 different courses uh, that we organized. Uh, we founded um, uh, something we call Matzak Media Campus, uh, campus um, where we, uh, that, that replaced the old form of education for journalists we had before. Um, that is a much more attractive program uh, that is, of course, um, uh, trying to attract people with digital skills and then improving them. Um, and uh, so, but it's not only about hiring new people and, and educating them, it's also about educating the staff we already have. And what I, what I find a lot now, um, after years of hesitation and years of ignorance, uh, is that a lot of people finally get the message um, that they have to move, that they have to uh, adapt to that new world. And the second thing is, yeah, we're investing in new people with digital skills. Um, and we do this um, because we also plan new products. Um, so for, that is, we just announced that a few days ago that at the end of the year, maybe, um, I hope, hopefully, it's a, of course it's a big project and you never know when a lot of uh, coding is involved uh, when you're ready, but um, uh, we are hope to launch a new national news platform. That sounds a bit uh, strange if you look at it first, that the a regional publisher starts a new, re uh, new national uh, news platform because, hey, nobody waits for that. There's already Spiegel Online and there's Focus and there's Build and you name it. There are so many uh, strong competitors, but we said, hey, why should we research all those um, stories, national, international um, stories? Why should we have, we, last year we had three interviews with Chancellor Merkel, but then um, where, where could you read them? On, on build day and on uh, they they get all the traffic with uh, the things we uh, we publish um, because our regional newspaper websites are um, well they are like you described it before they're doing their thing yeah? and um, so they they may be uh, used for stuff that we that we produce in the um, central newsroom and maybe not um, uh, we are changing the workflows now, uh, but I think it's a good idea to have our own digital presence for um, the centralized newsroom as well. Uh, that is not saying that we are, want to compete directly to those big players that are in the market, uh, but I think it's important for, for the self-confidence of the team and for presentation of what we do, and we are quite confident that, that we have some good ideas to, to get a nice little market share. But Wolfgang, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just wondering, um, how might that work? Uh, because uh, you, all of you, of course, want to get the best journalists on the market, mm -hmm. and these uh, also are journalists that are focused on national uh, uh, topics. Um, uh, Funke has decided uh, uh, not to uh, build their teams uh, in the city of Essen, mm -hmm. but in Berlin, mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, NOZ uh, moved from Osnabrück to, to Hamburg for that. Uh, for that for that team. Mm -hmm. You are sticking to the city of Hannover. That's Who wants right. to come to Hannover? Um, well, uh, I wanted to, first of all. And then uh, you'd be surprised. We got, um, we uh, in the last two weeks, we got more than 300 uh, applications for jobs. Um, and uh, there have been a good, um, there, and a good amount from uh, Hamburg and Berlin. Uh, Maybe because people sometimes are not satisfied with what they do right now. Um, maybe, um, but maybe also our project is really just interesting, and maybe it's it's the next step in a career for somebody. Um, so now, right now, we are looking for um, site managers for national, international coverage, but also site managers for regional coverage, and then we look for specialists for social media, for, for search engine optimization, data journalists, uh, video, um, and motion design. So we build complete new teams, and that for a lot of people seems to be really attractive. And then there's, uh, we, we thought about it. Uh, I must say we thought about, sh should we also move our central office and uh, new, uh, newsroom to Berlin? But there's, there are also very good arguments that speak against it. See, the people who are coding, your, all your developers, um, uh, we have them in Hanover. Um, all the rest of the company, the, 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 the people, the marketers, they are also in, in Hanover. So right now we have in one place everybody who is working for the publisher together. And that also has 
its advantages. Uh, I mean, you have some offices, uh, more the business side in Essen, uh, and we have it all together in um, in, Hano in Hanover, and we have a, a strong office, a head office uh, in in Berlin um, with eight correspondents, um, and, and I think this this works pretty well for us. I have a question when it comes to your um, national website. Mm. Because, uh, of course, um, I think all the centralized units, especially when it comes to digital, have at one point or another thought about having their own website because it would make things a lot, of, a lot easier, I guess. Um, but aren't you getting in direct competition to your regional websites if you're creating a new one? Maybe not, uh, because maybe you can even um, uh, strengthen both. Uh, we looked at international models who, that, that exist. I mean, there is uh, the, the most famous model probably is the U.S. publisher Gannett, who has 109 regional newspapers, um, and uh, their, uh, if you say, fl their flagship brand for national international coverage is the USA Today. That is a printed, uh, of course, uh, edition there, and, and also there is an online edition, and they have a quite interesting model to intervene those uh, those two uh, um, offerings. Uh, so if you, if you look at, um, at the website of, let's say, the Tennessean or the Detroit Free Press that belongs to the Gannett Network, um, they, then you read a story about Syria, you read it on your regional paper. You see the headline, you click on it, you are staying on your regional paper. And only if you want to dig in deeper, if you want to read a connected story with that, a related story, then uh, you jump over to um, USA Today. And in the background, um, all the Google traffic gets pulled on USA Today. And the, I think that's a smart model. Um, Murdoch does something similar in Australia with news.co.au. Uh, that is like the, the, the brand that is uh, for national and international news. Um, and that is connected to all uh, of Murdoch's uh, news corps, uh, regional newspapers in Australia. It's, they don't have a printed edition. And so we looked at those models. The Trinity Mirror Group is quite interesting also in, in Great Britain. And we, it, we looked around the world and saw that is attractive to us. And we just want to mm -hmm. give that a shot. So you're putting your national website behind the local websites in a way? <sighs> I like just I mean, the, we are a regional um, media company. And we'll stay a regional company, a media company. Uh, the goal is not to weaken the regional digital um, products by, uh, by launching a new national product, but uh, the other way around, uh, strengthen those regional uh, products by, by, by cross-linking to the platforms and by, uh, by finding an intelligent way to, um, yeah, to, to link them. Okay. How are the other two of you thinking about that? Uh, is it a, uh, a model for NLZ and Funke to start a national platform as well? Right at the moment, I would say no, because we um, want to solve or want to make our first step to make our existing digital platforms stronger. Uh, they, are, they, have a, um, they have a leading position in our region, but I think we have to somehow defend that position. I used a very military-orientated uh, word uh, <laughs> some uh, minutes ago, but um, we have to, so I think NOZ and SHZ .de and the other platforms of our media group, they have a, um, they are well known and they are trusted in our region. But I think we have to, to, um, to make them even stronger and maybe defend them um, uh, towards um, competitors from the national perspective that come into our region. The second reason is that I think that the um, national market for digital news in Germany is highly saturated, but. I, I'm very um, excited to see what Wolfgang is doing. Maybe we have to s do the same in one year or two years. Well, as I've said, I think that all centralized newsrooms, when it comes to digital, at one point or another have thought about that. We had two, of course. And um, when it comes to the future, how Funke Online is uh, developing, what we're doing, what we're planning, it's part of a broader planning. That's how I, 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 when I... When I remember that right from visiting your newsroom, you already have an internal... Yes, we have an internal website. one, which is really important for us, um, <laughs> especially for um, the colleagues in my online team, one former one is sitting here. Um, for us, it's uh, pretty important to 
to see on, on the web, on one page, what we have produced. Because, as I've said before, the different websites don't have the obligation to put our stuff on the front page, even if you want to. Of course, there are things that we are, and we are trying to advocate for. Hey, this is a really great story. I think it would really be great on your front page, but it's the decision of the, like the um, people in the regional newsrooms. So um, when it comes to our team, even the, pr the colleagues from the print section, if they want to see what we have produced during the day, because we do between like 50 and 70 pieces um, a day, then we have an internal website that functions chrono chronologically um, where we can see what we've done. So this is like our own website. I think if we had our own real website, it would look a bit differently, of course, um, but uh, it's pretty good for the moment for us to see how it I works. I just wonder, why don't you just turn the switch and uh, <laughs> go live? You know how this, why don't you do just <laughs> <laughs> works in media companies? It's but not I, as easy. So. But I will predict that you will do that because uh, uh, the, 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 the main product you are doing, um, that's a regional newspaper, with uh, national and international news uh, on the paper and on the web is a model that's uh, on the long run is dying. Uh, the programs now, the centralized news teams will help uh, uh, to, to live a bit longer, but the, the, the people, the subscribers and the visitors who expect uh, that uh, their regional newspaper is also doing the national news, uh, I, I think um, they will not be there in a couple of years. Daniel, I, I, I'm not so sure if I agree, uh, um, because I think even if you're a reader of a fairly small regional newspaper, uh, if you go there, you expect the biggest national international news um, to also be shown there. So I, I cannot imagine a regional, uh, a, a digital offering like a, a mobile website or an app uh, from a regional newspaper um, that concentrates only on regional and local news. Uh, I, I think people would miss something there. Um, so it'll all, there will all, will always be a mix, and it, it, uh, it'll be our challenge to find the right, the right mix. Yeah, but buyer service would, uh, would uh, fit that need, I, I, uh, I think, no? You don't no. think so? No. Why? Uh, because that's too generic. What I would like to talk about also is how those centralized newsrooms change the way we work. Because I think um, I have worked in different newsrooms, both print and digital, and the way we work in the centralized newsroom is quite a bit different when it comes to the amount of communication we have to do, when it comes to the amount of compromise that we have to find between all those papers and all those websites. Um, and I'm pretty sure that you already have or will have, in a way, the same criteria or the same problems when it comes to to different ways of working. For example, we um, in the digital unit where I work, we have a constant um, conference communication situation via um, a Slack clone. We're not using Slack, but a clone that is hosted in Germany, because it was important for our uh, media group that it's uh, hosted in uh, Germany. So we have this chat tool where we are communicating all the time. We are planning these five topics in the next hour. Um, oh yeah, we've seen the breaking news. Uh, we're gonna send you a news as soon as we can. Um, these are the three videos that are gonna be published in the next few hours. So this is a constant communication that is quite different to the way I have communicated before my, my former workplaces. So um, I would like to talk about that for a while, how work structures and even maybe the positions of people within a newsroom have changed or have developed. Maybe you can... Yes, what maybe for me the most important point in every discussion with, the, uh, with my team and uh, in the hiring process was the the role of that kind of people that work in a centralized newsroom and they are some somehow they are divided into t two personalities <laughs> they are um, they have to be independent in their 
uh, journalism, of course, in, in the, um, in the selection of um, which stories they want to cover and they don't want to cover, but on the same side, we are some kind of a service provider. So um, if our local offices do not um, like our work, we have a big problem with that's in easy words. So um, everyone who's working for a, a centralized uh, news team has to, um, to, to solve that. So he has to, um, to be um, self-conscious enough to, to, de to defend and to, to, or to, to convince the local editorial teams that this kind of storytelling concerning the Syria crisis or, or whatever is the, 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 the right way. And, but also he has to be open for wishes and um, um, all uh, falls back to communication. And <laughs> when you, when you are ever- Diplomacy, a, I'd call Diplomacy, it. yes. Yes, we can kind of diplomatic, uh, and but you have to hold that in a in uh, in a in a, in a um, yeah in a way that every that not everyone will be um, will be confident or uh, happy with your work. I think um, <laughs> you can uh, confirm that that um, you have to hold uh, that on a level that m allows you to work. Um, how you want to to uh, to to cover national stories? I think it's the same for print as for digital. That you have to find a compromise between the character of the single newspaper or the single website and a kind of standardization that is necessary to fit all of this. So you always have to think. Okay, I know this. We have different websites and. Some of them are much more local than others. And we know that some of our stories will be published on these three websites, but never ever on those three websites. So it's always a kind of, yeah, it's a challenge to, to find the stories that everybody kind of likes and then to um, publish the stories in the right order. Like I know that this website would like to have that story faster than that story, but there were other websites who want it the other way around. And this is the same for the paper. You have papers that have kind of a, I wouldn't say a political direction, but kind of a, a character that is unique. And if you have a centralized newsroom with also like editorial pieces that go in a several direction and that might not fit the character of the newspaper, this is a constant battle, a constant challenge to find that kind of standardization that makes it possible to work in a centralized newsroom because you need standardization otherwise you really you go crazy if you have to do it like 12 different times but still you want to keep the character of the paper and the website I mean mm -hmm. it might be the same for your papers right absolutely I mean I, I like the way you describe the challenge of communication um, it's it's exactly true and I mean that is of course, the big change from the print world to the digital world, uh, that you're not only communicating like in a conference in the morning once, planning the paper, and then look at the ready-made pages in the, ed in the evening, maybe have an update during the day, and, and that is it. That is, you, don't, you didn't need a lot more communication in, in the old days. Now uh, you really have to talk within seconds about decisions you are, you are, uh, you are taking. And that is also one of the reasons why, why we think uh, we will see if it is a good idea, but we, right now we are convinced it is a good idea to bring the people together that produce those regional newspapers in one room. So for all those 12 uh, uh, websites that belong to the Matzak Media Group, we will have site managers in one room. They of course have to come from the regions, they should know their regions, they should know what, uh, <laughs> what the name of the mayor is and all those things. Uh, the regional knowledge is very important for those uh, for those positions, but then to have them all together in one room, sitting next to the people who produce the then RNDDE, our national platform, uh, we think that can be a big improvement because then you can talk to each other um, and you don't need uh, technical uh, 
uh, uh, uh, systems to support you. Right um, now you do it via Slack or how we, do you? Yeah, we do it. Um, well, we have, of course, also conferences where video conferences. There's two video conferences in the morning with our partners. Um, and then uh, in, the, in the course of the day, we also use a chat system. I mean, everybody who's working in newsroom knows do not use the telephone. That is just not the way to work. Uh, Chat is much more efficient. Uh, we also have uh, our homegrown system. Uh, we, that's called Stashcat. It's pretty much working like uh, another, like Slack. is, is uh, very similar to that. Um, and uh, we are, of course, organized in groups there. Uh, though there's a group for politics, and there's a group for economics, and then there's a group for regional, and there's a group for you name it. Um, and of course, you can also have a direct communication in the chat system. Um, so, yeah. But you're going to have still one person in each region, yes. right? Yes. What is that person going to do? That's kind of the liaison officer uh, who is, uh, uh, that person um, is in charge by, uh, in, in, in talking to all the people in the, in the regional newsrooms, uh -huh. what stories they have. Um, and, uh, and, and always talking to the, um, to the team that is in Hanover and, and producing the page. Um, so because we, what we have is, you, you, you said it before, the regional editors are still in charge of the front pages of the newspapers, and the regional editors, in our case, also will be in charge in the future of their regional websites, even if they are done in Hanover. And somebody has to um, talk to, of course, to the producers and tell them, uh, what to do? What what the, uh, if the if the if they run a new story on page one uh, on top of page one, uh, or if they want to uh, I don't know uh, get something removed from the site? Uh, the editing chief can always say this. Uh, we are not we are not uh, taking all the decisions um, in in this uh, centralized newsroom. It's interesting uh, that you talk about the diplomacy and making all the single newspapers, of course, um, uh, happy. Um, when we are looking uh, how you, uh, both of you, I think NRZ uh, doesn't have that, that issue, how you, both of you are handling exclusive content, mm -hmm. we are seeing that, um, that uh, you are labeling it uh, with your centralized, uh, 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 centralized news uh, team, um, so the brand of it, uh, Funke um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. Mediengruppe or, or Redaktionsnetzwerk Deutschland, for you, that uh, I suppose doesn't help uh, the single newspaper uh, to to get renomé. Um, no, that's right. How, how is it uh, how is it uh, fitting in the strategy uh, to to support the local newspaper? Well, that's pretty easy. Um, if you build a, if you build a national brand, um, and um, uh, it, then it gets much easier um, to talk to the big shots. And if you, if you have more access to the big shots, um, you have better content and better stories for your regional partners. So. But on the main, on the main uh, uh, news program, uh, the Tagesschau in, in, in Germany and the radio stations, they say, they, they say Redaktionsnetzwerk Deutschland, uh, Angela Merkel talked to Funke Media, uh, they are not uh, saying uh, the, that the politicians uh, talk to Hamburger Abendblatt mm -hmm. uh, or the Hannover Allgemeine Zeitung. Yeah, but no, no reader ever buys a newspaper because um, uh, in Tagesschau somebody said it it was uh, researched by uh, Süddeutsche Zeitung, NDR, and whatever. Um, I, I think that is just that is just not so important. It is more important for uh, this the standing um, in, in in Berlin, and uh, and is important also for self confidence of of our editorial team. I think for the yeah for the for the for the team for the team in in in, uh, in the in the, in the uh, local newspaper it's self confidence it's important, uh, but also for the for the subscribers and readers to know that their newspaper uh, is important. Well, but then look at do you remember that little sign on on a lot of computers saying Intel inside? See, uh, every uh, all the, all our partner papers have that um, uh, on on page on top of page one it says partner of the Redaktionsnetzwerk Deutschland. Uh, so people know about that partnership, of course. I think that this is a, um, an important point and that it's a, a point that is discussed a lot, especially in, I can only speak for Funke, because of course this is, it, it's a problem. I mean, you have a centralized newsroom, you have it named, uh, there was a decision of the higher uh, hierarchy, so there's, it's a fact, it's, it's named like that. 
Um, but what would be um, an alternative? I mean, you have, we have 12 regional newspapers. You cannot like list all the papers. So you have to find, you have to find a kind of brand. And our hope is, and I, I believe and I hope that it's uh, really working like that, that the smaller papers get something out of that reputation that is created. Because we, um, the brand, uh, I speak for Funke as well, for Matzag and also for Nuts Media or Dumont or Ippen or uh, what all those, region, uh, those centralized news uh, rooms are called, that um, they have gained in reputation a lot by all those exclusive stories, by the rankings that are really, we're overtaking all the big, um, the big players, which is not only great for our marketing team and for, for the publishers, or, and they're pretty happy as you can imagine, but our hope is that a part, or as much as possible of this good reputation shines on all those, those uh, papers that are named differently, of course. But I wouldn't say that it's not a topic that is discussed, of course. I mean, it's a different name, and I'm not sure whether all the um, readers of our papers directly connect the name Funke Media Group to their own paper. I would hope so, and of course we have also the, the um, uh, yeah, we, we try all the, all the things that we can do to, to achieve that, but we cannot be sure of that. But I mean, there's, it's just a huge improvement for every single paper. Look at how often was Westdeutsche Allgemeine Zeitung quoted in, in, in Tagesschau before um, Funke founded the centralized newsrooms. Once a year, two, maybe. Now uh, it's, uh, it's like every week. Daily. Nah, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> yeah, no. so, yeah, I think it's true. So um, before we have to end all this, I, um, I assume that in case you had a question, you just ask it, but I want to give you the time right now to ask all the questions you have. Maybe you should like say who you are and then who the question is addressed yes, to. The mic. My name is Daniel Puntes. I'm an uh, editor-in-chief of Reportage, a small publication in Switzerland. Um, and I always admire Germany for its diversity uh, of opinions and of papers. Now I see that in one case 12, in another case 15 papers are together. Um, of course, there's a lot of efficiency by producing news, as you just showed. But my uh, worry is about the political ideological diversity. Uh, are your regional papers obliged to take the same title and the same lead of the things you produce? And, or, is, uh, or is this a kind of a getting all the together and you have one, we, one view, political or ideologically, uh, in these groups? I can only speak for Funke because the models are quite differently. What we do when it comes to print, um, we produce complete pages. Um, politics, business, entertainment. Um, the titles, I call it titles, like the customers, titles, they have the possibility to just say, we don't want to have that story or don't want to have that story, but they either take the story or they don't take the story. Um, sometimes we have um, different sizes of the story because the layout is different, um, but they get the same story and uh, also the title is produced by us. What we don't do is, uh, when it comes to editorial pieces, we offer the editorial piece. Like we say, this would be our argument in the editorial piece. You can either have it or not. And especially when it comes to big decisions like elections and stuff like that, um, the uh, editor, editors in chief of the regional papers, they prefer, of course, to do their own editorial pieces, but they get an offer and they can decide whether they can have it or not. So I think when it comes to um, editorial pieces, which are basic for the character of a newspaper, um, it's just an opportunity, an offer, but they don't have to. Yeah, it's, it's, it's similar. I think um, you're, you're changing more single pieces and uh, you do more adaptions within yes. the pieces than we do. Um, our workflow is uh, we have that um, meeting in the morning where we have that video conference uh, and we, um, we tell them what we plan and it's then also discussed. And then some papers say, okay, at that with that story we are out. We don't want that. 
or we do something our, on our own. Uh, what every paper can do. Every editor-in-chief in, of our regional papers is free to do all the opinion pieces himself or, or his own team. And of course, also they can always opt out uh, of what we produce. What we are not doing is that we are changing uh, well, yes, of course, and if, if our ideas are stupid and they have better ideas, then of course we change the plan. But once we agreed on a plan, then in the course of the day we don't change it ten times. Uh, then we, we cook it and it gets eaten like it is cooked. Um, and, um, but uh, of course every editor is free to write his own leader, uh, for example, and uh, that in many cases is also necessary because we have a lot of peop uh, peop uh, papers in the West and in the East. And if you write about, let's say, Russia, Putin, uh, that, that is always a subject. You cannot have one leader for East and West. Still not. Uh, you have to you look at this differently, and you have to uh, you have to you have to look at your audience. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, there are challenges there, of course. This is what I meant with standardization. Of course, we have regional aspects of stories, and there are some stories for print, for example, where you have a really specialty in a region when it comes to studies that are done and that are uh, divided into the federal states, for example, and you have different numbers for different federal states. And then, of course, sometimes, it depends on how the colleagues work, sometimes they do like five different pieces with one like concentration on that, uh, the numbers in that region and concentration on numbers on the other region. But in general, we try to standard to have a standardization that makes it easy to produce 12 papers at the same time. I mean, there are people who are doing nothing else but putting the pieces to 12 different pages. It's, yeah. Other questions? Of course. Sure. My name is Eva Sedenholm and I work in Finland for a company which publishes five regional newspapers. This is very familiar topic for <laughs> me and a lot of the same, same questions. Mm. Uh, the scale is a bit smaller than your company. But I would like to hear uh, uh, something about um, your newspapers' websites, are, are they using some kind of paywalls, and if, what kind? And uh, in reference to paywalls, how valuable seem uh, international and national news to be to your readers? And please be honest. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we'll get to the one. Um, well, I, maybe to make it short, we have different paywall models in our media group, but uh, but um, we we have um, a, a metered mo one website has a metered model metered model combined with the freemium model. So um, you can f read five articles free, read another five articles if you register. But we also have articles called NOZ Plus, like Build Plus, uh, SZ Plus. Uh, all these FAZ plus, um, everyone in Germany calls it plus, um, who are um, only readable if you register or pay on a one article basis. Um, we think that for both paywall models, um, for the metered mobile, even more, uh, a good national, international coverage is very important because you are, a metered model uh, punishes you on your usage. Uh, this is my way of seeing a metered model. You, you, uh, you're reading 10 articles and then boom, there's a paywall. And maybe uh, this, um, this, this moment can come on a, on a national or on a local story. And so we have to, to offer the same quality uh, or, or even almost the same quality on every topic or, um, uh, or area we cover. Um, plus model, um, in the freemium world, I'm not really sure if we can um, um, get the same success with national news compared to local news um, because most of our um, articles that are b behind a freemium paywall or a plus paywall try to, to attract people in a, in a problem that they have in their normal life. Um, so how can I come to this new 
um, uh, um, uh, to this museum or uh, how, uh, uh, so we, we try to, this is no, not always exclusive content, that is sometimes um, a content um, which people talk about. So, but I, I am sure that we are also um, enabled with our new team in Hamburg to produce uh, quality content um, for a, a plus model on every of our websites. If you want to uh, hear some, uh, some uh, numbers, uh, right now we have a um, percentage of 20% of the total reach of our website that comes out of national and international news. The rest is um, local. Yeah, in our case, we, uh, the, the, the publisher, publishing house experimented with all kinds of pay models. Uh, so like Freemo model, metered model, mix of both, uh, metered model that is open for social traffic and so on and so forth. And nothing works, uh, to be honest. Uh, right now, nothing works. Um, so we uh, said for uh, certain um, field, uh, um, for certain fields, we concentrate on a reach model. We started new verticals. Uh, there's a soccer vertical we started called Sport Buzzer, um, and uh, that works pretty well for us. Um, like we quadrupled uh, the reach in the last year um, by concentrating on soccer on one platform. Um, and when we start uh, rnd.de, the new national news platform, we are not going to start it with a paywall. We, are, we, we concentrate on reach first. Um, and we are right now in the process of rethinking our, uh, yeah, our pay or, or subscription model uh, for local and regional news. Um, personally, I'm convinced we have to to move more to a lead wall than a, than a paywall. We have to more make more more interesting packages and offerings uh, that uh, and, and not only have uh, like the the. Um, the dollar sign or the euro sign next to an article. Uh, that is, we, we have to get rid of that um, and we have to come to a, to a, to a more attractive um, form of, of a subscription that contains more than just regional news. Um, yeah, I cannot say much more because we're in the middle of uh, a discussion. I can only tell you what we did so far. Uh, we are not satisfied with it. We have different models as well, and there are some papers who have um, their local stuff behind the paywall. There are others who have local, regional, and national uh, behind the paywall. We're also experimenting with that right now, so I cannot talk a lot about that. <laughs> Maybe this one, more question? But what we can say that uh, in Germany, there are two uh, publishers who are I think quite successful with their pay model that is um, Zeit Online and Süddeutsche.de. They are, I don't know how successfully they are really, but they, are, they say that they are satisfied um, and that is a combination of a, a metered and a, and a freemium model. Yeah, so I think that might be the way the, 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 the publishers move in Germany. I think one more is. Sorry. Um, I was wondering, when you created uh, the national newsrooms in the first place, how many people you had to let go and whether there was some sort of backfiring from the employees that, well, I, I can just imagine that that had to be done. So um, how was that situation when you think back? Uh, when it comes to us, um, there was more like a restructuring because there were no, I mean, we built this newsroom in Berlin and uh, everybody could have applied for the newsroom in Berlin. So if uh, one's position at a regional newspaper, for example, was moved to Berlin, they had the possibility to go to Berlin. Otherwise, uh, they would have had to look for a different position in their region. But there was, I cannot talk about the numbers directly because I, uh, I don't know them, to be honest. But it was, the, the central newsroom was not um, a way to let people go. It was just a way we put a lot of money into this, so there was no. Uh, it was not a model to get rid of people. Okay, that's I, okay. I think it's even more actually. Oh, okay. We w the newsroom started with like 55 people, both print and digital, and we are now at 70. So there are more positions 
in Berlin. I cannot speak for all the regional papers. I'm sorry, I just don't know the numbers. But the newsroom in Berlin is growing, and it's still growing. Yeah, thank you. We are in the process. Last, last one. Last one, okay. Thank you very much. I'm just a reader. I'm not a journalist. And I live in Berlin and in Perugia. Um, I, I was very uh, surprised because uh, the three quarters of this uh, conference uh, could have been uh, about normal business, not uh, really uh, press and journalism. And, um, and then I thank, thank very much the journalists after the um, Apple uh, computer um, <laughs> who brought in um, the uh, problems of uh, journalist standards and uh, also was trying to say something about the um, qualified journalism. What is qualified journalism? And uh, I think that there's a chance in, um, in the regional uh, journalism yeah, to bring high quality, yeah? because you are with real problems. Yeah? And um, therefore, um, the regional uh, platforms and newsrooms and so on should be uh, really a system and a, um, of a policy of journalists to bring in uh, standards and subjects uh, which are uh, uh, not only for the, say, uh, um, say just for uh, having the brand new news. And um, I, um, I will be uh, brief. Um, I see in Germany the uh, problem of press concentration still existing. And um, there I didn't hear anything. And I fear that also on the regional level there uh, will be um, uh, continuing this uh, concentration on the um, conservative, conservative uh, type of uh, policy. Thank you very much. Is it more like a statement than a question, right? Or do you want to? Okay, we're done. Okay, thanks for uh, having joined us, and uh, yeah, have a great yeah. day in Perugia. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Schnaps? <laughs> Zwei. Yeah. Du? <laughs> More surprises. You would, you would, yeah. <laughs> I would be you surprised. You would be surprised. <laughs> <laughs> Things have changed. <laughs> <laughs> In Erfurt war es mehr Apfelschorn. <laughs> In Berlin. Wir haben die Sitten verloren. You knew yeah? me at a different stage. <laughs> ah, I see. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't changed a bit. <laughs> so, und geht die schon? Uh, hmm? uh, no, vielen Krieg. Dank, I was really happy. Bin ich mit yeah. meinem Kriegszitat schon irgendwo? <laughs> <laughs> Haben wir uns irgendwie, ich hoffe, wir haben uns nicht um die Probleme zu sehr rumgedrückt, ähm, aus deiner Sicht, okay. Er ist ein großes Stück im Medium Magazin ja? natürlich, okay. aber er hat gesagt, alles, was wir jenseits von hier gesprochen haben, wird abgestimmt. Das geht nicht, also klar. Was man auf der Stage zeigt. Ja, danke. Ja, danke. Ja, danke. Ja, danke.
could also talk about Facebook. Let's make it easier. Can we? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to our panel on how to communicate Europe more or less a year ahead of the European elections. Um, so I will just give a very short introduction and then you will have all time to listen to our speakers and I'm very, very happy to welcome them and I will shortly introduce them to you. So you have Rima Juju Del, Del, Chick, no, yeah? I practiced the whole morning but it was not enough. From the representation of the European Commission in Zagreb in Croatia. Um, then you have um, Yuka Niva from Finland from television over there in Finland, so journalist. And then you have two MEPs, so members of the European Parliament, one coming from this country, Italy, Marco Affronte over there, and then you have Bas Eickhout from the Netherlands. So we would like to discuss today, and in this one hour and 15 minutes, how we can communicate Europe, because as you all know, it's not the topic where people are naturally interested in when it comes to the European elections in general. Um, interest is very low in most of the member states, also the turnout is lower than in national elections. And um, when I prepared the panel, I was just realizing that I was getting very old, because when I did my master thesis, um, I, um, I had already this question, how can we generate, generate a kind of European public space, how we can we raise the interest for European politics in the different member states, and I realized that was 16 years ago, and um, we basically still ask ourselves the same questions, and I don't have the impression that much has improved back then. It's perhaps even getting more complicated, because on the one hand, the European project is not considered anymore like just a great project everywhere. There's much more Euroscepticism in the member states. And on the other hand, also reporting is getting much more difficult in some of the member states. So that is more or less the setting we are in now. And um, it would be great if at the end of this session we could have some um, nice and innovative ideas how on the one hand the media, but also on the other hand, mm. the European institutions could um, improve the communication to uh, yeah, raise the interest and uh, get more people interested in European politics. So, first of all, the speakers will have um, three minutes, I said, let's see if they respect it, to uh, make a short statement as an introduction, and then we start with the questions, and I would say as soon as you have a question, just raise your hand and we make it as interactive as possible. So, first perhaps Rima, if you can, yeah. Rima, it's your turn. Thank you very much, Ruth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real, real pleasure for me to be uh, here. I think that the microphone is working fine. Uh, again, my name is Rima Jojo-Delkic. I come from uh, a small office of the European Commission in the capital city of the newest member state in the EU, which is Croatia. I'm a press officer, and I've, I've been a press officer in this office for the last two years. And it's been a great challenge, actually, to communicate the European projects to Croatians who have been uh, faced with a lot of political and economic and financial challenges in the country. So uh, the uh, topic, how do we communicate Europe uh, before the elections and after the elections and during the entire cycle is, sorry, it's, it's fine. It's, uh, always a relevant question. I don't think it will ever come out of the agenda. Uh, we need to always think about how to improve our communication with the uh, uh, general public, actually how to engage with the general public, how to get their interest. And there is no uh, one simple answer. Uh, and to me, when I think of it a bit deeper, it's actually back to the basics. Uh, so yes, the technologies are um, very much uh, have improved, the, the platforms have uh, increased in numbers, but again and again uh, the, the main point uh, are the citizens and the communication towards them and feedback from them, so two-way communications. This is in short for me for the start and then uh, I leave the floor to other colleagues. Then I would say let's go to Yuka from the journalistic Finnish point of view, with some nice experiences you had, I think, in the, before the last European elections. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jukka, I'm from the Finnish state broadcaster YLE and uh, I'm the head of our news, news lab and I was responsible for our election coverage in the last Euro elections of 2014. And for media, European, European Union and especially the EU elections are somewhat problematic, as you may know. They feel distant and boring, which was a dream come true for us. Because uh, in a situation like that, you can really start to experiment on different things. Uh, traditionally, all the elections go in a certain way. On, in TV, you have a party chairman and the top candidates debating, and like it, like it has always been since the, since the 1960s. What we did last time was to turn things upside down. We had all the Finnish Euro candidates, all 240 of them, one to in one to one election debate. We arranged 240 election roasts or debate before the elections, made highly shareable stuff with all the candidates, with candidates that were really good, with candidates that didn't even know the difference between commission and the parliament. And what it created was a value, more value-based election debate before the Finnish Euro elections, because you had so many people from so many backgrounds uh, telling us what they want to make of EU. And what happened was that in seven days it took one million views in a nation with five million citizens. So it was a huge hit, this boring election. And what we decided 30 minutes after the election closed that we will do this again next year and we will do much more radical experimental stuff. So Euro elections being boring are just the perfect spot for news houses to experiment on anything. So I hope we can go a bit deeper into it later. Um, let's go a bit further south again to Bas from the Netherlands and then we yeah. move to Italy. I thought you would go to Italy. But yeah. <laughs> Compared to Finland, Netherlands is south, that's true. Um, well, I would say uh, when you said Euroscepticism, it's more difficult to have a debate on Europe now. I would say, and this is also for debate, right? I would say, thank God there is now Euroscepticism. I think what was a long problem in Europe, there was no oxygen in the political debate. It was just Europe is there, no one really knows what it is, but it's there and it's good. And that was it. That's not a way to attract people to political elections. People want to know at the political level what's going on and what are the political differences. And I think too long at the European level it was unclear where the political fight was because trust me in brussels you have the same political fights between left-wing and right-wing politicians as you as you have in national capitals sometimes the topics are a bit further away a bit more longer term so more difficult maybe but in the end there is always a difference in vision on how you see the society and how you want to form that and that's the political um, dimension that is hardly ever seen when we are talking about European politics. I think when people think of European politics, you think of buildings. If you think of national politics, you think of people. And I think that's the core of the problem. As long as we think of buildings and institutions, then of course you can't expect people to get enthusiastic about European elections. And I think this is really one of the challenges also for the politicians to make it more political, to make it more personal, to make it more clear where the political differences are. However, and then we go now to the next step that we need to take, and that is of course Euroscepticism, it brought oxygen in the debate, but it also made it debate very, um, well, one-dimensional. You're either in favor of the EU or you are against. And that's, that's, I think, now we really have to come to the level that being critical on what's going on in Europe doesn't necessarily mean you are anti-European. And I think there also you have a bit of a generational issue. Uh, I'm, I'm now acting for nine years in the European Parliament and quite a lot of my older colleagues, they quite often immediately translate criticism in the EU into you are anti-EU. 
And of course, as long as that is your attitude, you give all the freedom of criticism to the, end, to the real anti-Europeans. They are the only ones having a kind of a monopoly on critics, critics on, on European politics. And as long as you give that monopoly to them, of course you will not uh, have a good political uh, discussion. So we have to go beyond that one-dimensional one. I think their social Europe will be one of the key things that I would say, but we can go back into the debate on that, but that would be at least my opening statement. Thank you, and then we go to Italy where communication on elections is also pretty difficult, I would say. So, Marco, what is your take? Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, uh, it's easy for me to, to refer to the last uh, Italian elections also because the, they are fresh in our mind and also because many, many people, me included, thinks that uh, they were the worst uh, uh, electoral campaign ever. We didn't discuss about uh, content, we didn't discuss about team issues, uh, uh, that there were just dogs barking at, it, at, each, at uh, each other. So f for sure, uh, facing a new uh, European uh, campaign, a new European election, we need a stronger communication. And I would say that uh, we need it at two different levels. The first level, and, and, I, and I agree with one, uh, the, the, the second speaker, <laughs> I don't remember your name, is uh, at the basic level to explain people how the European Union works in some way. I can agree also with Bass, but uh, I still need that we, we have to explain more about the, f the functioning of the European institution. Uh, not only what is the difference uh, from the European, between the, the European Parliament and the European Commission, but how the process works to have some kind of uh, new legislation, new directive, new reg uh, regulment. Because if we are not doing so, we leave uh, the room for politicians, like Italian politicians, that usually say, is European fault. The, the, someone, like, the, like in the space in the Brussels, decided about this. Woke up in the morning and say, we need a new piece of law, we need a new directive. It's not like this. It's a result of a process uh, of a discussion, political discussion. M sometimes the discussion uh, lasts for one year uh, within the European Parliament. Uh, and it's a discussion, it's a democratic discussion, it's a political discussion that brings some piece of new legislation. And in this discussion, Italy is not something that like looking like there is in the discussion because we have politicians, Italian politicians also in the European Parliament, yet they yet have to participate and sometimes also participate to, to this uh, kind of discussion. So, of course, we need uh, more knowledge about this, uh, this, this functioning and the responsibility is on the educational system in Italy, is on the politician, just a, a brief, uh, uh, in, in the, just to say that uh, usually for the po Italian politician, the European Parliament uh, is something like uh, uh, to, to where to push old politician to go die, like a, an old, old elephant. Oh, it's not useful in there, so let, let's, let's bring it to, to Brussels to, to, to die somewhere, somewhere else. It's like this. For decades I in Italy, the, <laughs> so. and also uh, part of the responsibility in, to, in order to bring this, this basic knowledge is on the, the media the media, of course. Uh, the second level uh, is just an hope uh, for, for me, that, that, and I would like that, that the communicator here can say something about this. We need the help of the media, we need the help of the communicator to bring issues, uh, to bring topics in the political agenda, in the political discussions. Uh, in the last, uh, Europe, uh, in the last um, electoral campaign, we didn't hear anything about topics like climate change, the consequences of the climate change, the interlink, the, the relation between climate change and migration. We talk a lot about migration, but just, just like these people moving just for uh, uh, vacancy and not because they are, uh, because of real, real problem. Uh, the, the, the entire labor market is changing, and I want to have discussion on this. I want to have it in the political agenda. I want to have it in the political discussion. So the, the, the media cannot let the, the, the politician to say whatever they want or they bark at each other. They, they, they want, they, we need that they bring the discussion in some direction 
to have uh, answer from them so the people ca can decide what answer is better for, for their feeling, for what they think or what they say. So we need a, st a strong media to have a strong communication and we, we can do it. We have a year before the next uh, uh, European campaign, so we, we can do better for sure. Thank you. Um, well, already in your statements, I think you see also that in the different countries it seemed to be a different situation. Um, you say that you have to educate people, Buzz said you have to take, talk more about topics and about the differences in the parliament. Um, Juka brought some examples from, um, from Finland and Rima also was saying, yeah, we still need to explain a lot in Croatia. So perhaps we can go a bit deeper there. Um, what I mean, would we need to have the same approach all over Europe? Can we have different approaches in the countries? And what would be for you the most important things to communicate on or ways to communicate? So is it really about topics? Is it about explaining how the institution work? Is it a mix of all of them? So what, what should we do? What are your thoughts? Who wants to start? So, uh, Marco actually um, referred to the media, the importance of the media in, one, in communicating Europe. I just wanted actually to give you a feedback on uh, how the media in Croatia, the, their attitude before the accession. So, Croatia will, in, in a couple of, in, uh, uh, in June, will be the fifth year of uh, Croatia's accession to the European Union. Um, so, <coughs> The, the, mood, the, the mood and the attitude of the media before accession was so proactive, they were so hungry for every news of the EU. It was a strategic goal for the country to join. And then the moment we joined, it somehow stopped. Even the public TV, you know, they, we had shows on the EU, uh, uh, political shows, political magazine, uh, where we were informed, where the public was informed on a regular basis what was happening. And then after that, um, and I asked the editors-in-chief, how come? Well, their reply was, well, now we are a, a member state. We don't need those uh, political magazines on the EU. I said, maybe it's quite on the contrary, no? Don't you think so? So um, now it's a real difficult job, day in, day out, to work with the editors-in-chief and the, and the media and the journalists to provide them with the information, and not only with the information. Actually, for a start, they want a, you know, a, 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 a final product that they can only place. And then, so you have to take it from scratch, and then bit by bit, uh, build on this. Um, now we have a lot of commissioners, actually tomorrow coming to Croatia, uh, Vice President Katainen is coming, uh, uh, Commissioner um, uh, Sir King, uh, so the Security Union, and our own commissioner, the Croatian commissioner is coming, all three in one day, and all the media have, um, are doing interviews with them. So again, we started as if from scratch from the day we, we, we joined and building bit by bit on the national, regional and local level. And it's, it is hard work. It's, uh, again, on a daily basis. I would say this confirms a bit that that's why was it interesting before the accession? Because there was still a political gain to achieve, right? There is a kind of a political goal being part of it, and that indeed is it. That's that's much more interesting. The problem is that indeed, and I always find it difficult. We will get to the role of journalists, but I always find it a bit difficult to put a kind of a lot of responsibility in the corner of the journalist because I think in the end of it, it starts with the responsibility of the politicians also. And I think we as politicians have too long just let Europe be that one where you want to be part of, and once you are part of it then suddenly the political dimensions are out of it, as, as if it's a kind of a, a faceless bureaucracy where you can become part of, which is interesting when you're not, but once you're part of it, okay, then the politics is out of it. I think that's the problem, and that's something that you're not going to uh, solve by explaining. And this is a bit also the attitude of the professional, professional units of the European Parliament, 
who are always thinking of how can we sell the European Parliament. I think as soon as a political organization needs to think about selling itself, then you have a big problem, I would say. Then there is really something wrong. Because you don't need to sell, you have to show what kind of politics is going on. And of course there, the journalists should be critical towards the politicians. Just one example, uh, in the Netherlands we have a prime minister who is great, in pretending as if everything is a nature law, that what he is standing for, that you can't be against, because that's, that's normal, right? So on economics, it's also like he's, he's talking about comparing European economic politics, he's comparing that as if you're doing your own household at home. And of course you can't spend more than you have in your wallet. As if the governance, the economic governance of a state, of a European Union, is comparable with what you're doing at home. But by doing that, he's, he's sucking all the political energy out of the debate, and people think, oh yeah, he's right. Whereas, of course, that's a totally political decision, what you do with Eurozone budget, yes or not. And there is a political fight behind. So don't let yourself drawn into kind of an apolitical, technical debate. You have to challenge that politically. And then it doesn't matter that people don't know the exact difference between commission and parliament and council. Because if you ask people back home, do you really know the difference between a second chamber, a first chamber, or in Germany between the Bundesrat and the Bundestag? They also are far less deeply into that than we think. But there it's not a problem, and with Europe we always think, oh, it's difficult, so we need to know it. If that's our attitude, it's good to do that four years long, but not during an election campaign, I would say. Discussion. <laughs> Political since, discussion. Yeah. Since this is a discussion, I should say that I strongly disagree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, instead, I say I totally agree. Shoot. Yeah. Uh, bringing back politics would be really great and would make make the work of media a lot easier and a lot better. Uh, in addition to that, uh, media is not the only media. And that is a huge question inside Europe, but in every, ev everything you can just imagine, thanks to digitalization. Uh, we have politicians, we have uh, great interesting guys having 200,000 followers on Twitter. That's bigger than a circulation of a newspaper. So where's the media exactly? And the way I see it is that when we cover European Union, we, uh, and now I'm, I'm painting a black and white picture uh, in it, we have only one target group in mind, people that are interested in politics. We should have another target group, people that don't give, pardon my French, give a shit about politics, are not interested, but the decisions that are made in Brussels affect their lives. And how we make those stories that they don't have to uh, spend time with stories about Europe. They just need to know that this affects me. And I'm not talking about uh, stories uh, that are close to normal human being or something like that. I'm talking about content that could be used within seven seconds. Because uh, we are competing of citizens' time our greatest competitor might be Red Bull or I don't know who, who pushes content here. So what if we just lack a totally new form of journalism, the journalism that takes only seven seconds and just makes you understand what just affected you? But everybody says that Europe is so complicated, so how could you put that in seven seconds? Uh, that's the, is that the moment where I say discussion? Yes. Yeah, okay. But I, I mean, it, it, it is a bit the thing, because I can completely see what you are saying, but I also see the point that, for example, Marco made that it's so complicated and that people first need to understand how it works, and then, and then you say, no, I want to have seven seconds. So for me, it seems to be really complicated to put that all together. But Marco wanted to the say... The different target groups. If you have people that are not interested in that at all, you have to start from somewhere and then just hope that people get interested that, okay, they make decisions that affect me. Okay, how does it work? Marco. I would like just to say that 
Okay, me, uh, when I said it's also responsibility of the media, mine was uh, like a, a, a crime for, for help because <laughs> we, we need that because I'm, I'm facing this kind of situation. Uh, um, I would like to face uh, people, citizen, electors, and, and I want to talk with them at, to confront with other politicians in front of them using my best tool that is content. And the other one sitting uh, beside me is like, uh, boom, stop migration, bang. And uh, help, help us, uh, help them uh, at, at home, bang. So I understand that communication has changed a lot. And I understand that this has to be more centered to on a, on a political level, on a political discussion. But uh, I mean, we don't, we, I don't know at least how to use this kind of new instrument. And maybe it's not up to me to understand exactly how to use this kind of tools. Maybe I want that the, the communicators put me at the same level, uh, give me the same instrument to me and to the other politician that goes in, an, in another, uh, moves uh, to another level. I, know, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm explaining well. I mean, uh, I'm here, I'm, I, I, I need to say something. I need to explain how to, to reach a decision, to, to have a political decision, decision, and the other one say just uh, is, European, is Europe fault. How can I discuss with, with this one? How can I, if you communicator don't help me to, 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 to have a level playing free to discuss with these people? So, so that's why I, I said uh, uh, responsibility of the media, just to say, please help us. Help us to, do, to have a more uh, constructive discussion. It help us to, to, to play in the, same, uh, in the same arena with these people that are very smart, very, very fast, but uh, of course they lack, in my opinion, content. They lack the uh, systems, as I, if I can say so. <laughs> Um, just uh, one quick thought. Uh, when you say political debate, um, again, I have to refer to my own country. Um, the Croatian citizens are actually extremely tired of political debates. They not only do not want to engage, but uh, they don't want to, they are actually bitter, angry, frustrated. So uh, when you offer political debate uh, to them, it all depends on how how will you discuss whatever topic? It's not only a heated debate that will make things more interesting for the citizen. If it's something indeed that concerns them directly, then yes. Uh, but um, for instance, again, tomorrow in our uh, parliament, there is a debate on the Istanbul Convention and there's been a very heated debate uh, on the political level and people are really tired of it. So. Uh, Again, it will all depend on the content and whether, uh, whether it concerns them directly and whether it, it affects their lives directly. So uh, it is tricky. And when you say your prime minister uh, is comparing the uh, budget of uh, the government budget to his household budget, I think in simplifying, because we always try to simplify our narrative so that we can get to the citizens because it's complex, it is tricky. So maybe it, it fires back sometimes. So, you know, it's all a bit of, uh, voila, a bit simplifying and then a bit uh, going deeper uh, to inform and to explain how the institutions functions. And yes, of course, I do agree with you that it needs to be political. Actually, President Juncker said that the commission needs to be more political. Now that you've mentioned <laughs> the political debate. Let's not start. We yeah, don't, yeah, yeah. We don't uh, need this debate. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but yes, there is a point, of course. I mean, otherwise it is all about building. It's all about procedures. There is no face to it, and there is no, uh, no, uh, no relationship with the citizens. Well, and even the faces we have, they are not known in the member countries. So <laughs> that, is, that adds an, an extra um, difficulty. But Yuka, what would be for you a kind of 
what would you say you would need from the politicians or from the institutions to make great content about Europe? What would be for you a dream delivery? I would say that bringing back the politics would be just the traditional only way. Because, like you said, uh, selling it just somehow doesn't make it, even though that it's really important that people are explained how things work. Because it's, it's really hard to understand how Europe, Europe works. So it's really, really uh, necessary to do that. But bringing back the values that what kind of continent would we like to have together? That's what it's all about. So are there already questions in the public? Then we could, yeah, please. Uh, thank you. Um, really interesting topic. Um, at some point, uh, you mentioned the uh, need for from media, and we have an example from Finland uh, that they have the uh, obligation to uh, portray it, to talk about it, to mistrain European um, elections. What I think it's going on is that. There is not only a lack of willing from the media to cover the kind of uh, election because they're politically considered as inferior as a national, but for me there is a lack of European public sphere. And I wanted to know what is your point about it? Because if we consider in terms of media, for example, there is the example of Euronews. Euronews is there, exists, kind of like overcome the language barrier, but still some scholars consider it a failure in terms of media success. What do you think about it? Um, uh, we come to that question of a European sphere, right? Uh, <laughs> it's nice. No, 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 no. It's it's uh, you, you you end up quite often in that that question. I think really it it matters on how you define that, right? I I think. The idea that we can create some kind of European media that is covering topics throughout all the, en the entire continent, stop it. I don't believe in it. I, I, I really don't believe that that is achievable, maybe on the very long term, but, but just, just the cultural differences, the, the settings in the debates are so different. You need national media who understands that national context and gives them uh, their coloring of, of the issue. So, so I'm not a believer. I mean, you have a couple of things in Europe, of course, in the EU bubble, which is very informative uh, for the ones working in the EU bubble, but it's not really attracting the people outside. I think the only one that can deliver a bit of it is Financial Times, but that's for a very professionalized audience that, that uh, is already globalized itself, so to say. But normal people don't read Financial Times. Um, uh, that's a quote, that's a quote. <laughs> I, I don't know whether, do I insult someone now? It's, uh, <laughs> but, I, I, uh, but I do think that there are very clearly topics that people are concerned about in the same countries all over the place. Everyone is talking about refugees and migration. Everyone in Europe, everyone is now talking about what's going on in Syria. Everyone is talking about it with a difference context maybe, but everyone is talking about it. And I'm pretty sure that also in the elections you can make European topics, topics where people th uh, talk about. Like I said, for me, it is about social Europe, that we have the problem in Europe that you have one internal market where companies can freely, you know, they can pick and choose their employees, they can go everywhere, but then taxation is still national. It's a heaven for companies. Everyone understands that, that that is a problem because we see that the taxation of companies is going down and then of course governments need to get it from somewhere else so they hire the taxation on labor or consumption, VAT is going up everywhere. That is a problem that people understand and people understand that there somewhere, Europe, it's also on migration. When you say, um, what do I say to people who say I don't want migration and it's the fault of Europe? I think the, the biggest mistake is to say, no, no, it's not the fault of Europe. You can say, yes, it is the fault of Europe. 
because the problem is that we are not solving it together. Also there we're doing it halfway. We created one internal Schengen area, but at the same time do national policies on refugees. That's stupid, but that's how we arrange it. So attack that and challenge those people that say, I don't want them. Okay, but how are you going to arrange it? And quite often all the polls show that people understand that you need to do that at the European level. People understand that, so don't shy away. And I think it's most of the politicians that are wrong, that are so afraid of the voters that all their advisors say, don't talk about Europe, because it's not popular. And you see all these politicians, okay, I'm not gonna talk about Europe. Yeah, of course, then it will never get popular. And here you can learn one lesson of Macron. All the, we can talk very long about it, and no, I'm not a fan of him, but he did one thing right. He didn't listen to his advisors that said, don't talk about Europe because everyone in France said it's killing if you talk about Europe, and he did it. He talked about Europe, so maybe that's another thing, maybe politicians should listen less to their advisors and more to their own hearts, maybe. Okay, so there is a European space And that's a d debate in the European space, I would say. So, European space of topics, yes, but no European media, in a way. Are there other opinions on this on the panel? I, just, I, would, I would like just to add something on what uh, Bas said, because uh, be careful, because uh, it's true that there are some topics, of course, that uh, uh, um, are concerned for uh, all the, the European countries, and migration is one of these. But be careful, because when you say to uh, a people from uh, Netherlands, yes, is Europe fault? They react like, the, okay, open the discussion, improve the, the, this kind of process, work better. If you do the same in Italy, they say, ah, oh, it's Europe fault, let's go out of the Europe. The, the reaction is very, very different on this. Can I, can I react just immediately? Because this is, a, this, I, I think it's a key, key concern, and it's right. Currently, the support for Europe is so vulnerable that we have this problem. But I think if we shy away from it, we maintain that problem that any criticism immediately becomes a quite of a fundamental problem of the EU. Yeah. The problem is that until now, the ones who said we blame Europe also immediately said, and we want to get out. As if that is the only taste, huh? if that's the only uh, game in town. Yeah. And I think the stupidest reaction of us would be like, okay, don't, now I'm not going to criticize because then I will be part of that going out. Yeah. Because then you keep the only option for being critical is going out. And I think we need to create a new dimension that is you can be critical, but very pro-European critical. I think that dimension needs to be developed. And that's not easy, I'm not saying that, but I think it's crucial if we want to make Europe survive. I, know, I would like just to say that how difficult it is to be critical on Europe and to be pro-Europe in Italy. Just, just to, yeah, to say this. Yeah, but that's a problem. And also, um, okay, I, I, I want to go too far, but this kind of discussion, this kind of path brings to the decision of Italy to do an agreement with Libya. That, that is terrible, it's something very, very terrible. And the people clap on this. So this is the situation. That's why I th I'm saying, of course, uh, the situation, of course, uh, the, the European Union is one single European Union, but the situation is very, very difficult. It depends on the, uh, what part of the Europe. Before going to the next question, I just wondered, is there an agreement on the panel that these these European media, they don't really work? Oh. I actually don't agree, I have to say. Um, I mean, you, you mentioned Euronews. Um, I think that they have their values. It's a complementary media. It's not the only one, but it is complementary. And uh, the way further is actually to give Euronews uh, in, in different languages. And this is what the citizens are asking. Euronews in Polish, Euronews in Croatian. So we do have correspondence of Euronews in all, maybe in all capitals, but not even. So this is, this is maybe the way forward to get more correspondence around the, the European Union and candidate countries and give it a local, in a local language. This, this could be one option and then to explore more. 
And we keep talking about migration, how it is the biggest challenge of, uh, of the decade. I mean, yes, of course it's complex, of course it's very difficult. And the, the problem is, which is natural, that the citizens want, want solutions. They don't want the debate. They are not interested in the debate. They want a solution, a ready solution overnight. <laughs> this, is, this is the problem, this is the challenge, I think. Uh, you mentioned Euronews, and what if the Euronews would air more kind of union criticizing debates? Absolutely, absolutely. And get out of the bubble and just would be the sphere where you can criticize and criticize and fight about it. Should we stay together or not? Bring back the politics again. No, but I, I would like to know how many people here knows the European media and uh, use uh, the European media. How, how many people here knows that uh, there is a European a, a Euro news or so the, 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 the um, dedicated uh, political, for example, or dedicated me media from uh, Europe? I'm, I'm, I'm asking to you because... <laughs> <laughs> All of them. Okay, hope. <laughs> there is hope. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm not sure this is a representative... Uh, no, but may, maybe not. Of course. Audience, yeah. yeah, it's more the FT Euro News public. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I saw another question here. Thank you very much. Um, Helen Derbyshire from Access Info Europe. Um, th thanks for this very, uh, it's very important debate, this one. Um, I have a two-part question, one about part about transparency, one about languages. Um, Bas, you said it doesn't really matter if people can't distinguish the, although you said some other things which maybe contradicted that, but anyway, you said if d whether decisions are taken at the national level or at the EU level. Um, but we've got a problem, if, if, if I understood you right, we've, it seems that we've got a problem which has been touched upon in this discussion of uh, the lack of transparency at the EU level permitting national governments to blame Brussels for decisions which they themselves have actually supported. And it comes from Brussels as if it were something other. Uh, and it's in that context that it's very difficult to talk about Brussels. Mm -hmm. um, now, it, it, I would identify, I work on transparency of the European Union um, pretty much 24 hours a day at the moment. Um, and, and one of the problems is a, is a lack of transparency which frustrates the, uh, the, the possibility for civil society, for media, to really know what's going on in Brussels. Who, took, who concluded the EU-Turkey deal? Um, what, who is taking decisions inside the council? We don't know often. And then we get involved in um, silly campaigns, frankly, to get the commissioners to publish their travel expenses, which used a huge amount of our resources. So far we've got, we secured the publication of two months worth of travel expenses after a three year campaign. Are you, and is there any wonder that people are blaming Brussels? Um, or it, you know, it, it fits with a narrative, that la resistance to transparency fits with a narrative of a corrupt elite that's running the Euro Europe that doesn't actually have an interest in the citizens. And when you see journalists being killed, a journalist killed for investigating spending of EU funds in Slovakia, and that's jumped upon in the debate uh, in the European Parliament by all the anti-European elements to say, oh, look, it's just proof that Europe's corrupt, and when journalists try to investigate, they get killed. It's horrible to see. So that's the first part. My question is a reaction to that. And the second part is, um, it was mentioned what, what the language is that Euronews is available in. Fantastic. We're presenting a complaint to the European Ombudsman next week. We've mapped the websites of all the institutions and agencies to see in which languages it's possible to understand how to exercise your right of access to EU information. And all of them are violating the right to, to operate in all 24 languages. Most citizens, if you don't speak English, and maybe French or maybe German, you can't communicate with the European Union institutions. That's another problem. So there are some things that I'd like to hear a reaction about. How do we solve those in, uh, in order to make the European Union appear more accessible and less remote? Thank you. On the transparency. Um, I think it's hugely important for the functioning of the EU itself to, to keep on pressing this case of increasing transparency, certainly in the Council, absolutely. However, I'm not quite sure this is a campaignable topic. The problem is that 
people are getting a bit tired that one side quite often is saying, uh, the, the national politicians say it's Brussels fault and then almost always the reaction of the Brussels politician is, no, no, but it was your fault. People are pointing at each other and I think that's the politics where people think, I don't know anymore and you know, I don't care. They just, they, they, they just, they, they switch off. And that's the biggest danger, people switching off and just don't care anymore. And I think that's the problem with this issue that people at a certain moment, they just don't know it anymore. And then, okay, I'll leave it. It's, it's, and it's only, that helps the picture that Europe is complicated, that just goes on. I have no idea, I have no grip on it, let it be. And then suddenly someone comes, no, we can also get out. Oh yeah, that might also be. And there you have the two, two tastes, right? So this, that, that's my problem. So yes, very important, but I have my doubts on whether it's campaignable. What I think is that it is so important that at a certain moment when you have political, of political discussions that people then are interested in, oh, but how was it decided? And then transparency should help you in knowing how it was decided. But you do it through that angle. So the transparency is very important to make sure that once people get interested, they also can follow how it worked. But you first get them interested in the topics, not in the transparency of it by itself. That's, that would be my take on it. But how do you get them interested if there isn't enough information? Do you really know what that's, why I say that, <laughs> that's why I say that it's an important fight, but yeah. not necessarily a campaignable thing to start your uh, European campaign for the European elections tomorrow with. That's my point. On languages? Um, so maybe on languages, um, how are we... Um, fighting language bar barriers. Uh, as you might know, uh, in each member state, we do have a representation of the European Commission uh, to communicate in the national language to, to the citizens. Also, we do have an entire network of uh, European uh, direct information centers, 13 in Croatia, so on the national, regional, and, uh, and local level to be as close as possible to the citizens in the national language. Plus, we have a number of, you know, on a daily basis publications uh, in Croatian and daily news in, in Croatian. So, yes, uh, languages are barriers and it is a challenge, but it's all proportional with the resources that we have. So, I mean, if we don't have enough resources, we cannot, uh, I don't know, broadcast your news in all, uh, in all languages. Voila, so we are managing somehow to a certain extent. I, I do assume that it's not enough, but um, we'll explore further how to, again, face those barriers. Are there more questions? Yeah. Uh, to, to Mr. Affronte, regarding Italy, because I'm Italian, so, um, specific question regarding um, the way that fake news is affecting Italy. Um, I think um, um, regarding, regarding the, um, the, the parties that are against going against Europe in, in this period and that are uh, actually uh, gaining and have already gained uh, support from that some, a big part of the population that is sick of politics and political debate. Um, how can we, um, how can Europe and members of the Euro European Parliament, um, Italian members of the European Parliament, start a debate and find solutions to, f to fight against fake news and fake sites that are uh, spreading all over Facebook and all over the social media and are really badly affecting the way people see Europe and the way people um, mis misunderstand solutions that are made for Europeans? I don't know if it's a cl clear question. Um, I need 40 minutes, uh, Aran. <laughs> no, it, it, well, at least I will start and they start. Uh, oh, the, oh, yes, 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 yes. No, no, no. There, there, there is a debate on this, at least at, 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 the, at the European level, but, but I think that. that uh, um, at the European level, we 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 we, are, we have not realized how much of a problem 
it, it is. And in the last uh, Italian election, and I'm, I'm not talking about just fake news, I'm talking about this kind of, of uh, very rude uh, communication, like uh, very short messages, uh, also fake news, but also some uh, building uh, different truths that you can use it depends on, on uh, what people you have uh, in front of. This kind of, that, that, that's why that's why in the beginning I was so frustrated when I said I try to talk about content, I try to, to sell my content, to sell my idea and the other ones uh, shut uh, slogans and, and nothing more. The results of, of, of this of course uh, we have it uh, under our uh, eyes because, if I say so, 50% uh, of people in the last election voted for populist. If, if I, I don't like uh, a lot this, this word, but anyway, we, we, we can simp simplify the, the things like this. And uh, I don't want to go too far also because uh, <laughs> I would enter the, the, the also the, the discussion about the Five Star Movement. I was there for seven years <laughs> and I left the Five Star Movement also because uh, this kind of communication, also because uh, a, a lack of internal democracy and, and many, many things that I don't like in that, in that party and now this is the, the the most important parties in Italy, they, they have 32%. So yes, in, in Europe we started uh, this kind of uh, discussion. I think that we are at the very beginning and, uh, and, uh, and also I remember <laughs> a speech of uh, Matteo Salvini in the European Parliament saying that, uh, are you crazy people? You are here discussing Facebook and fake news when people uh, is dying for poverty, when migrants are invading Europe and something like this. Th th this is, again, I need the help of the media to combat this kind of, uh, uh, of, uh, of um, instrument. They have a very strong instrument at the moment and I don't have the same instrument. I don't know how to face this, to face this kind of uh, challenge. Perhaps Yuka can help. <laughs> First of all, thank you for that question. It's hugely important. To start with, uh, the national parliament or European Union and the media and the PR people, it's not a closed circle. The the fake news are here to stay because it's the greatest business on this planet. You don't need any money and you can make really good money in a very short time. It's not going anywhere. The only solution I see is that make your children as educated in, in school as possible. And the way I see it when I look at my kids that are 10 and 13, they already know that if you click something, it's just stuff. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm I'm more concerned about. Oh uh, yeah, oh, all right, I'll be there next week. <laughs> but I'm more concerned about grown-ups, about mid-aged people, because we are more in the kindergarten of social media, and it seems that the the ten or twenty-year-olds they are in high school of social media. So I just would educate and educate children, and they will then tell their parents that, hey, you are dumb. Uh, but also, it's really important when you mention media itself, uh, the EU critical people see the traditional media houses as part of the problem. So, we have to kind of tackle the whole issue upside down. Ask people more, what kind of continent do you want to create? And other thing is that is highly important is that fake news is the word of a year right now. 
it's everyone talks about fake news, it's really important to define what is fake. Fake is something that is 100% not true. Fake news is not something that doesn't fit my liberal worldview. And I've seen this coming, because fake news is used so much these days that the definition of fake starts to evaporate and it becomes political, like fact-checking got political in the US election in 2016. Fact-checking was liberal. Everyone was fact-checking that Trump is lying. What do you got? You got the media with the, re with the reputation that, oh yeah, this is the East Coast liberal media. But we're gonna be screwed for a year or two, but it's gonna be better Thanks to all children. And thank you for pr bringing that issue up. Anybody else? Yeah, I just had also Rima who wanted to react. You said perhaps shortly. Oh. Yeah, okay, then first the question. I'm, I'm curious also of hearing Croatia because I think it's, mo it's closer to Italian situation and Finland. than Holland and Phil Netherlands and Finland that are really, really another world for me at least. And also, Later on, I uh, would like to um, also hear from you if you're optimistic about the future. Um, if you if you think th if you think this tendency will will start to um, improve towards you know thanks to young people, because I don't know I, I'm from the north of Italy and in the north of Italy, young people are pretty well educated on this topic. But I don't know maybe in other parts of Italy they're not, As, not Calabria not Calabria only. <laughs> The entire south. <laughs> okay, so perhaps for <laughs> first Rima and then we go back to Marco. So yes, indeed, we Croatians are very much, I mean, like the Italians, we have a similar mentality. We don't, maybe we don't have necessarily this a similar culture, but uh, we are very much like you. And uh, fake news in Croatia also uh, is a big deal. However, uh, um, it's, it's now, um, it's becoming clear actually for everyone what is fake news and uh, that is playing a big, a big role in the, in the public debate. And people are getting um, more cautious. Uh, educating kids, absolutely, but uh, educating adults uh, as much. It's necessary, we cannot wait for our kids to grow up because it will be another context, there will be another challenges, but we need to educate the entire public, ourselves first, and then everyone else. Um, I mean, everyone at the same time. Um, when we talk about, again, social media and traditional media, I don't, I'm, I'm not very fond of statistics, but I think that I've read a Eurobarometer uh, report lately who said that the trust of the public in the traditional media is higher than uh, the trust in the social media. Because in the social media, you don't necessarily have a debate. You have reactions. You have, uh, you know, um, bitterness, anger, frustration, but not necessarily a debate. Where actually the traditional news, they give you a platform with analysis, report, feedback, information, uh, what's lacking is the, is the two-way communication, which is a plus for the social media. So again, we cannot exclude any of it. We, we, we now have a choice, too many choices maybe. And uh, democracy is becoming more complex to consume because uh, uh, people, for instance, for the commission, they, they perceive it as a service that delivers results. But now they, they want choices. Citizens want to make choices with the institution. They don't want the institution to make choices for them. So uh, they do have all the platforms and all the methods uh, to co-decide. But paradoxically, they don't, they don't have the time. They don't have the willingness. They don't have the hunger, the appetite for it. So. Um, or it depends again from one, one topic to another. So traditional media is still playing, is still playing its role, I think. 
um, so our time is also almost over already, but so Bas wanted to react and then we go back to Marco that she can still answer the question on Italy. Time flies when you're having fun, right? Um, <laughs> I hope that's also for you guys. Uh, but maybe I just want to react to you saying that, um, you know, that, that Italy, Croatia might be different than Netherlands or Finland. Yes, there are differences, but this debate is everywhere. And every country is struggling with it. So, so really, don't think we in the Netherlands don't have a huge debate about fake news and still are having difficulties how to deal with that. Uh, I think one thing that we have to realize is that fake news has been around always. It's not a new thing. What is new is now, thanks to social media, it became a profit-making tool. So it, it accelerated a lot, but it has been around. Now just read the British tabloids, I would say, and I would say you can have a lot of fun with fake news. Um, so so it, it is not, but of course we have now, because it accelerated so hugely and so fastly, there we have to, have to uh, get around with. I think why you are getting a bit dissatisfied with the answer of you, you know, it's education, education, education. It's because it feels a bit like, yeah, but that will take very long and the problem is now. But I fear it's the only right answer that we have because think of the alternative that we pol politically are going to do something about it. Then you are going to give the politicians the right to decide what is fake news. Well, I would say that's a problem because we are in America, we have one president who is telling what is fake news, and here we say, oh, but he's not right, but who knows? So really politicians giving the right to say what is fake and not, and then what? Can they then forbid to, say, to tell fake news? In the end, this needs to be a societal development where the society itself can harness itself and deal with fake news in the way it is done. That's the only way, and maybe in one country it takes longer than in another country, but any other faster option is probably not what I would like to see because it's giving too powerful tools to politicians, which I don't trust them to. About Italy. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I want to be, I, I want to be optimistic. And I will say so because uh, I think that when you play the game that, that the populist uh, played in the last uh, electoral campaign, you can do it for a short period of time. You can do it for a l f forever. Because you can say something and say the day after the, the contrary of what you said the, the, the day before. You can uh, follow the, the, the belly of the people and not the mind of the people. But when you have to confront with decision that has to be taken, then you have to show your, your card, the card that, that you have in, my, in your hands. So I don't know what will happen with this, uh, the, the Italian government. I think that we will know it in a couple of weeks. But some of them will be at the government and they, uh, they, they must start to, to work and they have to take decision. So it's different to say we, we will do this and it's completely diff different to, to, do, to, to do it uh, when, when you are uh, at the government. And, uh, and also if you build your, your ride on the fear of people, you win, we saw this, but then you have to, 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 to provide solution of this fear when you have the occasion. If you are not, then the, the other time, the people will bring their fear somewhere else. And this is not, this is not good, of course, because we, uh, I'm saying that we are building our political uh, discussion or our political option on fears, but the last part of the, uh, the last, uh, the great part of the last election, uh, camp uh, electoral campaign was based on, on this. So I am optimistic because they have to, to confront with their self, with their decision, with their idea of government, so the people will see what they have in, in, in hands or not. But I, I, am, I, I want to add also that uh, 
we need, in this case, Europe to, f to, to work and to fight and to challenge some of this fear because if in, uh, in two or three years uh, Europe, for example, doesn't take a, uh, didn't take a, a strong decision about migrants, let's say so, in a couple of years, in three years, we will have someone else that will run this, the, the, the horse of migrants like a fear to, to, to raise con, con votes, to, 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 bring, to, to raise up. So I want to be optimistic, but also we need, also, also we need the Europe to, to make some uh, strong decision to help us to bring some, something, something different because uh, Next time we will have some, some, someone else that uh, will say the same thing that this time as, uh, was said by Lega or uh, Five Star Movement. Thank you. So as I said, we are almost at the end. Can we have like 15 seconds each with the one thing to improve communication on Europe? <laughs> you were talking about seven seconds, so you should be able to do it in 15. <laughs> do your thing. <laughs> We are more, as a media house, we are more and more interested about the people that are not interested. And that should be our primary target in the coming years. And I would like to have people on the audience and in the panel explaining how they see the world, because the answer lies there. In 15 seconds, I would say don't leave the uh, criticism on how the EU is functioning right now to the Eurosceptics only. Because if you do that, then Europe will lose out. That's my s most simple. And there the responsibility lies with the politicians first, and then the journalists will do their stories around it, and then you get your public debate. But it's the politicians first. Don't shy away from that. That we should uh, bring back the EU values uh, in the debate, in the EU debate. We forget actually what are our EU values. We take them for granted, especially the new generation. And this we need to remind day in, day out what are our EU values. We need to bring this back to the, to the debate. Um. You mentioned the, the young people in your question. I think that uh, it's interesting to, to reach people that are not interested, but also we have to build a lot on young people. And uh, I think creating the occasion to meet young people will help us in the future because in this case we will have uh, people more sensitive and more prepared to face the new challenges and also with a different idea of uh, Europe that it is one that we have in mind. Thanks a lot. Um, thanks for you for listening. So we still have a year. So let's work on it. Thanks a lot. <laughs>